The married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Nicola Thorpe. A very good morning to you. It is six o'clock on Monday, the 1st of April. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Here are your top stories this morning. Electoral wipeout, the Conservative Party faces its worst defeat in history, according to a new mega poll with the Prime Minister's own seat at risk. Killer delays. More than 250 patients are dying every week due to long waits for A&E care. And time to re-budget. The energy price cap falls today, but other expenses are going up. We'll speak to experts to explain what that means for your money. And it's not great weather for travelling today. We've seen rain overnight. That's pushing its way northwards. There's still a lot of surface water and spray. Riding up from the south later, all the details coming up. Cheers, Joe. Now it's time for your headlines with Katie. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. Hundreds of patients have died unnecessarily each week in England due to A&E waits. Well, that's the finding of a shocking new study from the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. It's found there were likely to be an excess death for every 72 patients who spent 8 to 12 hours in the emergency department. And the longer the wait, the greater risk of death. In the month of February, nearly 450,000 people waited more than 12 hours to be seen. Households already struggling in the cost of living crisis are facing even more pressure. From today, seven major household bills are going up. Regular bills like council tax and water will rise. Water by around £30 a year. So will broadband and mobile phone costs. The good news is the new energy price cap comes into effect. That means from today, energy bills will fall. But there's some good news for millions of lower paid workers. The government's increased the minimum wage by more than a pound for the first time. National living wage is rising from £10.42 an hour to £11.44. It's a pay rise of £1,800 a year. Scotland's new hate crime laws have come into force. New offences have been introduced for stirring up hatred based on prejudice towards protected characteristics. Will they include age, disability, religion, sexual orientation and gender? And the X Factor star Lucy Spraggan has announced Simon Cow will walk her down the aisle when she marries Amelia Smith in June. Spraggan left the show in 2012 under difficult circumstances and became friends with the judge years later. She told the son she asked him if he'd give her away before they went swimming in the sea together. He said he it would be an honour. Those are the headlines. I have another update in about an hour's time. Lovely stuff. Thank you very much. Good indeed. morning. Very good morning to you as well. Um, right, Happy April uh, Fool's Day. Yes, and lovely to see you as well. Good to Nicola. see you too. Really We've not seen know. each other since I've had we, a baby. No, I know. <laughs> and, and the baby looks absolutely marvellous. Um, so and much. we're delighted to have you back. Thank so. you. It's lovely to be back. Let's move on now to our top story today. The Conservative Party could be left with fewer than 100 MPs. That's according to a new bombshell poll. Well, predicting the worst Tory defeat in history, more than a dozen ministers, even the Prime Minister himself, could lose their seats. Well, political commentator Matthew Stadlin joins us now in the studio. Matt, good morning. Good morning. Happy Easter. It's Happy... Easter, isn't it? Yeah, Easter I, think, Monday. I think so. The eggs haven't been finished just yet. Um, is there any chance that the Tory party can turn this around, Matt? There's no chance that they can turn it around, I don't think. I mean, if, if you're talking about percentage chances of turning it around so that they actually win and Rishi Sunak remains in number 10 by the end of the year, we're talking probably between 1% and 5%. So negligible, negligible. But I don't think it will be quite as disastrous, mm. quite as much of a wipeout as is being suggested 
by this survey. The survey is a chunky one, which is why I think we're all talking about it. Well, it's massive. It's, it's about 15,000 15, people, people yeah. rather than, say, 2,000 people that sure. you might expect with a poll. But I do think this relies partly on the reform vote holding up. Reform have done very well. They're sort of polling 10, 11, 12 per cent. Will that melt away as we get to election day and minds are focused? I suspect it will. If it doesn't, then the Tories really are in deep, deep trouble. Why do trouble. you think it will melt away? Just because I think that people will realise that they don't have a serious offering. Or even if they agree with their policies... In what sense? Well, even if they agree with their policies, mm. they don't think that they will actually have any chance of getting into power. And therefore, they might think their vote is wasted. Plus, there is obviously a campaign now from the mm. Conservatives to try and persuade potential reform voters that a vote for reform is a vote for Labour. Absolutely. Let's bring in uh, the chair of the London Assembly now, Andrew Boff. Andrew, when you look at this, we were just saying this is a, a mega poll of 15,000 people, the Salvation for Best of Britain. I mean, it is extraordinary. This is the Tories being set for what is being called a near extinction event, coming out with just 98 seats. Labour then being triumphant with 468 seats. Lord Frost him said, himself said, we need to start being conservative. He's right, isn't he? Um, well, what we need probably f uh, as soon as possible is the benefit of a general election when we can compare the two parties. At the moment, th those responses have been taken from people without the benefit of a, um, a, a programme from the Labour Party. And as we know, uh, there is no plan for in the Labour Party, just statements. Uh, every time they issue a statement, they'll change it the following week where at least with the Conservatives, you know that you've got a plan. Now, people haven't been given that benefit at the moment. And the uh, the scrutiny of a, a general election period uh, really does change the figures. And I'm still confident that we can, count, we can come out on top. Andrew, we, we've been talking about this for several weeks now, saying, you know, well, could there have been a May election? Could there be a summer election? Obviously, it seems pretty clear that Rishi Sunak's holding on to that hope that things could turn out better for him, but they just do seem to be getting worse. What do you think uh, the chances are of there being an election earlier than this winter? Um, personally, like, I have no more information than anyone else. And, um, but I, I would have thought that if we... Uh, in October election we October the 10th so I'm putting my money on oh, oh is that well that's I'm writing that down I mean it's really interesting actually because Matthew just in terms of that Rishi Sunak I think is in serious trouble here because we have the local elections coming up on the 2nd of May many people in his party are deeply concerned about their own majorities even if you've got say a 20,000 majority you're in serious trouble don't you think that actually there will be moves to depose Sunak the minute those election results are announced. Well, if you read that article in the Sunday Times yesterday, the Tory party is supposed now to be like a circular firing squad because they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. There is undoubtedly panic amongst Tory MPs. I'm sure there's panic in Cabinet as well. There's that saying, and I don't know how true it is, there's nothing as X as an X MP. And these people have mortgages to pay, mm. so they are desperate. So you can't completely rule out a rebellion, but I think it's very unlikely because if they choose yet another leader, yet another prime minister, since we all last had a vote, I think the public will throw their arms up in the air in even greater exasperation. But, but if you've had four, why not have five? And also, if that leader comes <laughs> yeah. in, if that leader comes in and actually becomes conservative and then says, right, we're going to actually reduce tax, we're going to do all those things that we said, we're going to turn the boats back, ignore the ECHR, mm. then maybe, just maybe, they can do it. Well, the idea that this is not a Conservative government is for the birds, in my view, and it will link into a story that I'm sure we'll talk about now or in the next hour, which is these killer NHS waiting lists. If you don't pay your taxes, if you try and cut taxes at a time of NHS crisis, things will get even worse. And I think the public have had enough. Yeah, this is a story that over 250 patients a week may have died for no reason, simply due to extremely long waiting times in A&E departments. What can Labour do differently?
Well, Labour will have to try to do something differently. Whether they'll be able to drive these waiting lists down, I don't know. I mean, they aren't promising higher taxes. So if you're not going to invest more money into the NHS, then you've got to try to institute some sort of reform that will drive them down. I mean, this is really shocking. We're talking about something like, this is an estimate, 14,000 of us dying a year who wouldn't have died had they not been stuck in A&E for mm. as long as they have been. And there is a target, right? It's a 76% it's a of patients, I think, target that you want to get people out of, out of A&E before the four hours, and that isn't being... That isn't being met Let, at all. So let's just bring you in, Andrew, here, because I think it goes back to the point you made right at the beginning, which is what does Labour intend to do about this? We know we are spending a fortune on the NHS, £173 billion, 11.7% of our GDP. The issue is we don't have enough beds. We had 300,000, uh, 300, we're down to 140,000. And as Matthew rightly said, the issue is people are not being admitted. The question is, do you think Labour actually has a plan? Well, they haven't got a plan. I mean, they're, they're, they're saying nothing about how we address the problem that we've got in waiting lists. Now, at, at least with uh, with Richie, uh, one of the five objectives to reduce waiting lists, he's had some success with the long-term waiting lists. And during this, uh, and in recognition of the fact that we have an issue, in, an extra six billion was found due it for at, uh, at the spring budget. So there is a plan. Um, the plan does seem to be working um, and we can address what is a very, very critical uh, report about A&E. We, we put the money in to address it. Now, the Labour Party has nothing, absolutely nothing, apart from saying, well, the same as them. Uh, and and you're, you, you're absolutely right. That oppositions have this ability to be able to promise the world, but they don't actually have to deliver it. If you're in government, you have to find the resources, you have, have to reorganise... Andrew, with respect, with respect, do you think that Rishi Sunak is delivering on his promises? I think he is, yes, absolutely. As we've seen, we've seen a, long, a, a fall in the... Uh, one of those was addressing the waiting list. We've seen a fall in the long-term waiting list. This is the AME waiting list. There's an extra £6 billion to come in uh, to, to uh, fund... Uh, the, the reductions in in A and E as well. So I mean, it's it's happening. The planning. He, he's taking some very. He's in a very difficult circumstances, but he's got a plan to deliver. And I'm, I'd much rather trust that than somebody who just promises without telling us how they're going to solve these. Just problems. want to get Matthew's response I, I, but to I that. Just, I, I mean, I, you're doing a very good job in trying to defend the indefensible. But let's remember that Rishi Sunak staked his reputation. 15 months ago on the, on five pledges. Didn't yes. it? One yeah. was to drive these these waiting lists down. And now we have front pages of one of the main papers well, in the country. Well, Let me just quickly make the point. Yeah. Long waits in A&E kill 250 people every week. So, so this this is let's go back to Labour. Let's go back yes, to Labour because the junior doctor strike rumbles on. They want 35% pay uplift. It's cost £2.5 billion. So how will Labour address that? Wes Streeting, the Shadow Health Secretary, I think has spoken rather refreshingly. Some people on, on the left will be terrified by Wes Streeting, but I think he realises that he simply doesn't have the budget to, to, to sort of pump masses of money more into the NHS, although experts will tell you that it is necessary. Can we find the money? Maybe not. So what's he going to do? Well, the first thing he's going to do is he's not going to treat it like a shrine. He's going to treat it like a public service, which, as I say, I think some people will find refreshing. He thinks that he can use the private sector. So he's going to be non-ideological in this in trying to help clear out these waiting lists. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it, mm. for a Labour party to say they're going to embrace the private sector, which they would never have done in the past. I think Labour has another problem as well. We're starting to see pushback about using the union flag, for example, mm. We're particularly from inner city MPs saying, well, it's alienating our vote. Also, their stance on Gaza. There's a, a figure out this morning saying 60% of Muslims or their Muslim vote will vote for Labour. They will have lost 40% of their Muslim vote over their Labour stance. Angela Rayner rumbles on as well. Look, there of course there are problems, and quite rightly, as we move closer to what we think is almost inevitably 
going to be a Labour government, there needs to be scrutiny. Absolutely there does. And as a journalist myself, and I hope this is true of other left-leaning journalists, if and when Labour get into power, we will scrutinise them. But don't forget, it was in the autumn that Rishi Sunak was talking about himself as a continuity, as, as a change candidate. Now he's become this continuity candidate. It's like Baldrick, I've got a plan. Well, these guys have been in power for 14 years. Precisely. Andrew, just really quickly, we've only got a minute. What do you make of the new proposals in the Criminal Justice Bill to essentially criminalise rough sleeping? How do you think that that measure is going to play out to the general public? Well, I think it's an appalling proposal and the government need to drop it straight away. It should not be illegal to be poor. Fining people who are homeless is absolutely a ridiculous proposal. In fact, it's something that I've gone on the record as opposing when Labour councils frequently do this uh, in order to show themselves being tough. It's this very Wes Streeting approach. I mean, Wes Streeting's copying everything uh, that we say, I mean, the, the, the trouble with uh, Wes is he's part of the right of me. Perhaps he should go and join the Conservatives instead. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much to Andrew Buff there joining us from Newport and Matthew joining us in the studio. Let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages now. As we've been discussing, the, uh, the mail leads with a shocking 250 needless deaths occurring on a weekly basis last year in England due to agonising waiting times on A&E wards. Moving to the Telegraph, it reveals that three quarters of England's second homeowners are set to be charged double council tax next year, and that will affect 130,000 properties. And finally, the Sun says, return of the king as Charles Charles, sorry, is photographed waving well wishes outside St George's Chapel this Easter weekend. Well, moving on now, and a new report has revealed that the post office continued to defend the civil lawsuit, spending £100 million of taxpayers' money, but knew that losses in a branch accounts in branches accounts, sorry, could be caused by faults in their IT system. What's more, post office bosses did not disclose the Deloitte report to the High Court legal team acting for the branch operator, and its existence has sparked calls for criminal charges. Well, Albert Harwood, solicitor at Howe & Co, who are representing over three quarters of sub-postmasters at the Horizon IT inquiry, joins us now. Albert, what are the criminal implications of this new report? Good morning, Nicola. Good morning, Good morning. David. Morning. Thank you for having me back. Um, I mean, again, we're just surprised that the evidence just keeps coming and coming. Um, just when you think that you can't go any lower sure. in terms of morals, suddenly you get this. In terms of criminal um, prosecutions, th there's various things which may flow from this. Obviously, um, there, there was uh, evidence given to the uh, to Parliament, to the Select Committee, um, which we now know wasn't true. Um, arguably, money has been received by the post office. Uh, this is one of the issues. So, the where there were um, the post, where the sub postmasters were paying money into mm. um, the the account for the losses, um, we don't know where this money went to. So, if this money, we understand it may have gone into. The, the profit and loss account of the post office, which would, then would have been shared as profits. And you say that, sorry, just you mentioned there that people had lied at the Select Committee inquiry. Is that, that that's what's come out of this report? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that we, um, evidence was given to yeah. say that, um, that, that there weren't any there wasn't any knowledge of um issues with the system and that people which could go into it. So, so let's and just report... let's just be really clear here because obviously this has affected real people who whose lives have been decimated by what is going on this deloitte report uh, entitled bramble essentially said when you look at this, can the, can the system be altered centrally? And that is, my understanding is, what they found is they realised that actually it could be. They then did not disclose that to the High Court. And yet, even knowing that, they still went after the sub-postmasters. Now, that is reprehensible. I mean, I completely agree. And also, the, there was, a, there was a, a process in the High Court case where the post office were basically outspending the, the sub-postmasters. So... Um, the sub postmasters obviously had limited funds. The, the post office yeah. had unlimited funds. And they kept pushing and pushing, even though they had this report, which they should have disclosed. I mean, the, the court procedure would say, if you have this kind of document, you should disclose it to the court. And more than a million pounds of unexplained transactions were transferred to post office 
profits. Do we know what happened to those? See, this is still being looked into. The inquiry is going to be restarting shortly. <laughs> and hopefully the inquiry will get to the bottom. And we've been pushing for this for now a number of years to find out exactly what happened. So, so do we think, so essentially, we were talking about the shortfalls that were being made up for mm -hmm. by the sub postmasters. And I think which that the was, shortfalls didn't actually exist, which, yes. which they didn't exist. But and I think that was highlighted so well in that drama, mm -hmm. actually, about the, the devastation that was wreaked on those poor po sub postmasters and mistresses. But so, so essentially, they were making up the supposed shortfall that was going into some sort of suspense account. They then moved that into the P&L that then reflected on the dividends paid to the shareholders. <laughs> We think that's or what, it's that possible. would be my understanding that that's the most likely. But I mean, we don't know, and I, I assume the inquiry will look into this. But I mean, you're then moving into territory of money being obtained, arguably by deception. Um, but again, this is something which would. The the other point is the police are running a, an investigation parallel to the inquiry. Um, so th they're, they're core participants, so they are looking at this. And as more and more evidence comes to light at the inquiry and outside, um, they will be taking this into account. And what's the next step for you? Um, well, we're, we're obviously running with the, the inquiry as well. So it's, it's disclosure. Trying to get any documents out of the post office is a nightmare. Um, and every time something comes out, just when you think you can't be shocked anymore, something else. So we're, we're at the moment, we're preparing for the, the um, inquiry and we're going through disclosure, but we're still making sure they still haven't disclosed everything. And the nightmare for all of the sub postmasters and mistresses continues. Even though the government has set aside, what, a billion pounds or thereabouts for compensation, surely they deserve compensation and they deserve it now. I mean, we've been calling for this. I mean, it, it's been so long now. And I think I've mentioned um, on other shows is that these families are still waking up in the morning. They don't have money to pay for the children's food. Um, you know, they're struggling to buy clothes for their children. Th this, you know, and when we look at the profits that went into the post office and it, it's, uh, the sub postmasters, it's their money that actually mm. went in, well, arguably. What are the legal mechanisms by which they could receive that money back? Not just the billion pounds in compensation that's been set to one side, but potentially, and we must say potentially, if these profits, these unexplained transactions were found to have been obtained, illegally, would they have a right to have them returned? I mean, that wouldn't really be my area, but I mean, logically, um, I, I would believe it probably would. It would maybe even become under the Proceeds of Crime Act. And, and just, just going forward, how do you see this moving forward as the inquiry recommences? As you say, just when you think it can't get any worse, it then does. Do you think there's more evidence out there that you are still unaware of? I, I'm, I'm sure there's more evidence. Um, I mean, this this evidence is coming out when it's been dragged out of the post office. It's been leaked. So my my personal belief is that more evidence will come out um, and hopefully the inquiry will be able to look at that and maybe the police if, if relevant. It's terrifying, isn't it? And also to think that Fujitsu and other, you know, actors within this story still have government contracts yeah. in different departments. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I know there has been talk about making contributions uh, to the sub postmasters, but uh, as far as I'm aware, I don't think there's been anything concrete, mm. um, which is disappointing. Yeah. And and just finally, on a human level, what has it been like for the the people involved, the nightmare they've gone through, and and of course they believed it was themselves at fault, so they put that money in themselves. The whole lives were turned upside down, and yet the nightmare continues with no closure. Yeah, I mean, I think the drama portrayed this perfectly. I think it was this, the people not having faith in themselves and started to mistrust themselves and think maybe they, they had caused it. Um, and as you know, it, it's got worse and worse for people. They, you know, financially and mentally, mm. their mental health has suffered. Um, it's just horrendous. Awful. Well, thank you for all the work that you're doing. It's just mm. gaslighting on a national scale. Yeah, I think that's exactly it's the right word. Absolutely horrific. And mm. you know, I just, I just really hope that they get the justice that they so deserve. Thank, thank you, you so both much. very much. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Thanks, Albert, for joining us this morning. Still to come on Talk Today. Well, three quarters of second homes face a hike in council tax, and Elvis haunts a Las Vegas hotel. Wow. <laughs> Rebecca Hudson from the News Movement and Conservative commentator Benedict Spencer here to take us through this morning's papers. Do stay with us. The time. 623. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker.
Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think but, like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 6.26. We'll have the weather in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. The King made his first major public appearance since being diagnosed with cancer. Kinsey Schofield is here with all the details. That's at 6.50. Plus, with the energy price gap dropping, TV licences increasing, and the national living wage rising, we're asking, what does this mean for your bottom line? That's at 7.20. And a sweet one for you at 7.45. We're meeting sisters who collected over 800 Easter eggs to donate to a local children's charity. Oh, very sweet. Well, but first of all, yeah, really lovely, actually. It's so a great, lovely. It's a really great story, actually. Talking of really great things, Jo, <laughs> <laughs> is the weather going to be really great? Well, you know something? Somebody commented just recently that now we're in British summertime, we've got an extra hour to enjoy the rain. There and we that's go. Pretty much the way right. things do look for the next few days, I'm afraid. <laughs> Still unsettled, and certainly some heavy rain to come today. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Yes, we've seen rain moving its way in overnight, some of this turning very heavy. And it's giving some unpleasant driving conditions with a lot of surface water and spray. And if you look at the pressure charts for the next few days, you can see it stays unsettled. We'll see showers, longer spells of rain. But until the weekend, it doesn't get too uh, windy. But certainly Saturday, Friday into Saturday, we are going to see some very wet and windy weather. So that's just to finish off the week. So for today, then, we've got two areas of rain working their way northwards. The one is across parts of Wales and the Midlands, the second to the north of that. Both of these merging together and then pushing their way in towards parts of Northern Ireland. 
and southern parts of Scotland. But through much of the day, northwestern parts of Scotland will see the best of the dry weather. Also, the sunshine is a cooler air mass, though, so temperatures only around 9 degrees Celsius. And then as that rain moves its way northwards, we'll see sunny spells and showers down towards the south. Now, if you manage to be in the sunshine and away from the showers, it'll feel quite pleasant. Temperatures probably reaching around 15 degrees Celsius, 59 degrees Fahrenheit. But where you catch those showers, they could be heavy and indeed they could be thundery. And as we go through this evening and overnight, not a lot seems to change. That rain area just edges its way slowly northward. You can see we've got this easterly flow, so it will feel pretty chilly underneath that cloud with the rain. And eventually, of course, it reaches northern parts of Scotland. Elsewhere, a slightly drier picture, but quite a lot of gloom around as well. And those showers by the end of the day becoming confined to southernmost coasts. But believe me, they will be back again for tomorrow. So those showers, you can see quite a nice start to the day. The showers bubble up and then later on we start to see further the rain making its way in from the southwest. So a wet day to come for Scotland with this strong east northeasterly wind, temperatures in single figures that will feel very chilly. And then further south again, sunny spells and showers. It's going to be a little bit cool, but temperatures still reaching around 14 or 15 degrees Celsius, 59 degrees Fahrenheit. And that rain coming into the southwest is likely to be quite heavy as it arrives. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. Well, Conservative commentator Benedict Spence and the news movement's Rebecca Hudson are here with us for a look through this morning's paper. Shall we start? Good morning to the two of you. Morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Um, and uh, happy Easter as well. Uh, Benedict, shall we start with you? This is the front page of the Daily Mail. 250 needless deaths each week due to agonising waits in a and &E. I yes. mean... The news for the NHS just seems to get worse. Doesn't it just, Doctor? It's, it's, it's really painful, actually, that it's just a sort of an ongoing litany of things that are going wrong. Um, uh, uh, this story, I think, a lot of people, uh, everybody at some stage obviously comes into contact with the NHS, either through themselves or a family member. I myself have had dealings with the NHS recently through a family member and have actually got some experience, therefore, of this scenario where people who are going into a &E who are being admitted you know, it's not like they're being, you're not, not being told that there's nothing wrong with you, but are then finding themselves on trolleys, in chairs. And actually, as anybody who has been to a &E can sort of be able to tell you, it doesn't take a lot to then see the system sort of backing up. And therefore, it's not surprising, actually, that people uh, do get missed and potentially do die. But I think the actual number, 250, that's a staggering number of people to think that are just potentially... Uh, losing their lives because of a backup in the system. And I mean, you know, we've been talking about the NHS uh, and its uh, various crises for years, uh, but it, it really has, you know, it, it's something, I think, when it's got to a point where people are potentially losing their lives, waiting to be seen, not quite getting the right amount of attention on beds, on trolleys, on chairs, standing up, whatever it may be. And Becca, what do you think the main cause of this is? Obviously, underfunding, long waiting list, but also is it down to social care and the fact that elderly patients are not being discharged at a fast enough rate because there's simply not enough people to look after them within the community mm. rather than a hospital setting. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a very fair analysis. The fact is the NHS is sort of picking up the slack almost for lots and lots of other services, whether it's mental health, social care, social services, addiction care, kind of all of those big social problems that warrant their own kind of agencies and systems end up going through an NHS, which, as we know, is already creaking. And it's also worth pointing out, this was one of Rishi Sunak's big pledges was that he was going to deal with the backlog, deal with waiting times, and he really hasn't. And this is the cost of us not addressing the problem with the NHS head on. So you're absolutely right. It's multifactorial. And of course, people can't see a GP. We've got 25% of GPs mm -hmm. leaving the service mm -hmm. in the next year, or certainly 25% <clears throat> leave without actually going into general practice mm -hmm. for very long. Mm -hmm. So you've got people who can't see GPs. So where do they go? They go to A&E. Mm -hmm. Benedict, what is the answer? Um, Many people say it's underfunding, but actually when you look, we're about the European average, £176 billion, 11.7% yeah. of GDP. It's a huge amount of money. We're throwing tons of money. Uh, in. Clearly, the NHS is not the most efficient system, and that's something that any government really ought to be getting a handle on. And I do think that the Labour Party would perhaps have more political scope to do so because it won't face quite so much of a backlash uh, if it does attempt to sort of streamline uh, aspects of the system. I know that Wes Treating has sort of been globe trotting, looking at other systems, saying, well, this works better, this doesn't, and saying that there isn't an infinite pool of money. But the thing is, 
a society, our society is aging, it's getting older, therefore more people are likely to use the system. It's also grown by about 7.5% in the last 20 years. If you don't keep up with that kind of capacity, and that means training more doctors, which we don't Which they train now in, are. Well, they, yeah, now, fantastic, wonderful, right at So in six years, it'll be fine. <laughs> exactly, and, yeah. but that's, that's the problem, isn't it? We haven't been training enough, and we've been hemorrhaging them elsewhere to other Anglosphere countries because they can earn more money there. But, Rebecca, mm. can I just ask you, uh, if, if there is a Labour government... Are they more likely, and it's fascinating about where streeting, are they more likely to be able to affect change because they will be in a more, a, a, a more interesting political position to say, actually, we need to slim down what we're offering or talk to the doctors or whatever, solve the junior doctor strikes? Yeah, so I, I think they do. I think they have a lot more kind of social and um, political capital almost in this space, don't they? Because they don't have the kind of 30 years of austerity, the narrative around the Conservatives that they strip away at the NHS without really investing in it. Whereas where streeting absolutely is, is very forward thinking about how the NHS could look involving kind of public partnerships, private partnerships. So, yeah, I think they've got a lot more capital to do it. And they've also probably got the, the, the you know, the kind of goodwill of NHS employees on their side a little bit more than perhaps the that Tory Conservative party. government do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah. think you're absolutely spot on there. Uh, moving on now, Rebecca, to the front page of The Telegraph. Council tax a second home. Yes. Weeping for those 130,000 people who own two houses in this country. So this is Michael Gove's big plan that if you have two homes, you might end up paying two lots of council tax. No, it's it's worse than that. It's it's a it's massive of amount council of council tax. tax. It's that, double. That, double. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's double. Nice but, but but the point is, a lot of these people who have second homes do so because they have to do it for work, and this is the natural. Uh, audience for the Conservative Party. So aren't they actually shooting their own voters in the foot who therefore will be less inclined to vote Tory? But I think doesn't this show what a crisis we have in terms of housing in this country that we've got all the, we've got two lots of people who've got two homes, some of which are sitting empty for months and months and months of the year while we've got other people under the age of 40 who've got no hope of ever paying any council tax on a home. So I mean, I, 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 and it's going to raise 250 million quid a year. So it feels like kind of obvious, but you're right. I mean, this is, this is a Conservative government that's slightly floundering. Like, how do you deal with a housing crisis? Oh, you have to annoy your sort of typical yeah, But that's a good yeah. thing, ultimately, is that yeah. one of the major complaints about the Conservative Party is that it has pandered to its voters at the de- to the detriment of the com- uh, country for so long. Actually, f- staring down the barrel of an almost inevitable defeat is actually turning around and going, right, well, whilst we're here and you guys are all saying that you're not going to vote for us, we are actually going to tax you <laughs> properly, which is very rare, it must be said, yeah. even for an outgoing government. But ultimately, I think that this is a, uh, it's something that we always talk about, the, you know, the sort of the lack of the money in this country. Actually, what drives this country now is wealth that is tied up entirely in property because people for so long have been Mm. told this is a good thing to invest in. Let's not make anything. Let's not actually have industry. Mm. Let's just have houses, but we're not going to build anymore and you just buy more and that creates wealth. This is an effective way, I suppose, of taxing a small portion of that wealth. It perhaps doesn't go far enough, but it's a start at least. But they're going to annoy their own voters and how many more houses are going to be available for younger people? Because my (laughs) suspicion is Mm. that not a huge proportion of Mm. those second homeowners will actually sell up their second homes because, as you said, they do it for work or whatever. They're just going to pay more council tax. But even if they did sell them, that doesn't mean that there's a market to buy them because wages are being suppressed and rates are too high. And this is is part of the thing. It's also part of the problem when people talk about, well, we just need to buy, uh, build new houses. If you just build new houses, actually, if the market is artificially inflated as it currently is, doesn't mean the price is actually going to become but, but surely more if affordable. If you then increase it supply that. and the government wants to get to 300,000, if you increase supply and if you do so significantly, say, let's build a million homes, mm. surely by the very definition, then prices will fall, won't if they? You yeah, have, exactly. no, not, no, not at yes. all. If Why you have not? a generation of people who can't currently afford the houses that are already there and you ask the people, right, who can actually afford, right, their hedge funds, no, their so landlords, the availability would ring fence is it. what makes it expensive. How do you yeah. ring fence that without breaking an awful lot of laws around protectionism? That's actually a very difficult thing to do. And this this whole idea, we do need to build more houses. I'm not saying that we don't, but this idea that if you just build more, prices will come down. No, they won't. They'll be bought primarily by people who have money, and that is not the people who currently need the houses so they because need they be need the prices to fall. So it won't work that Better way. regulation and legislation to You'd stop need, those You would need to buying. ban any foreigner from buying a house for a start. Right. You know, good luck with that. I just don't see that happening. Uh, <laughs> what do you think about this? Because just in terms of the election again... When Labour, if Labour gets in, Labour will be met with the same problem. So Mm. here we go again. What is the Labour policy on homes? I have no idea. Well, I think a lot of the problems is the regulation around building houses, so trying to make it easier to build houses. And also an availability of, um, a a broader availability of affordable housing stock. Obviously, these are, I imagine lots of these are very, very lovely second homes in the Cotswolds or Cornwall, which probably... Or they might be a flat, they might Airbnb them. um, Interestingly, the second council that's most excited about doing this is Hackney Council, because I think, to your point about people, you live in the city for the week, 
week and then you go off yeah. to a lovely, you know, yeah. somewhere leafy at the weekend. So let me just ask yeah. you, would you then ditch EU regulations like the net neutrality laws? They're the things that are stopping houses being built. Which I get, I, I actually, <laughs> arguably, yes, because what do you do about if we have generations of people who can't, who literally can't afford to, you know, get on the property? I'd say, yeah, I would, I'd well, say it, so. It, it has to be said, it's one of the things actually we haven't done in this country is look at EU regulations sensibly and say, right, this works, this doesn't. There was this attitude that we should set fire to everything. And then Kemi Badenoch saying, no, we're not going to set fire to anything so, because so we need to go through So how does that work slow. under a Labour government if they then say we're going to ditch EU regulations? The Labour, That's part, sit the very, Labour Party very is, the Labour Party is in for a really tough five years because it's got several different wings that if it wins a stonking great majority and there is no real political opposition it will have different factions saying now is our time to act that includes the hard left of the party it also includes the Eurofile wing whether or not any of them can actually get enough support to get what they want through and to actually challenge Keir Starmer I don't know that's one of the the, the fun things about potentially having a very <laughs> very large majority is trying to find out which wing of the Labour Party will take uh, take precedent I, I assume it would just be the centrist because Keir Starmer's had a very good grip on selection of the party and that's obviously caused all sorts of issues but you know it's it's, it's going to be an interesting five years, even if there are, <laughs> even if there are no Tories to laugh at. Say that again. Well, we're going to move on to the next story now. Speaking of not being able to afford a home, it would appear that the Tories are now about to criminalise homelessness. I mean, this is it, this is a weird set of regulations because what they want to do is it, it's very broad, open-ended um, new laws. Uh, that will mean that people can be moved on and potentially arrested for all manner of things. And the problem is actually the police already have perfectly good laws for moving on people who are a nuisance. And mm. let's be clear here, when we talk about homelessness, there is no just sort of homeless blob. There are people who are homeless for all sorts of different reasons, yeah. mental health, economic reasons, but there are also professional beggars. There are people who are professionally homeless. Uh, we can't get away from that. They're perhaps not the majority, but they do exist. But the laws already exist to deal with those people. So this sort of open-ended um, ability to criminalise anybody who is homeless, you know, it comes from the same uh, place that they thought, well, we'll make having a tent in the centre of London illegal. That'll, <laughs> that'll just automatically mean that people decide not to be homeless. It's not, it's not a very sensible thing. As you can see, uh, different parts, different wings the Tory party, you've got people like Ian Duncan Smith, quite, you know, on, on the sort of the, the firm right of the party, quite hard line on lots of things, or people like Damien Green, who's perhaps a bit more of a wet. They're all sort of coalescing and saying, hang on, these laws aren't a very good idea. And also politically, it really grates when you've got the Prince and Princess of Wales think, saying to everybody, our sort of, you know, uh, the thing that we're going to do in the, in the next couple of years is try to make homelessness less of a problem, and we're going to do it through far more compassionate things. So you've got two wings of the state, yeah. if you like, yeah. saying, we both recognise there's a problem. One says, we're going to try and do it you know, progressively, and the other goes, ha no, we're just going to make it illegal. And it's fascinating, isn't it? Because they've, they've, <laughs> Rishi Sunak has really made so much of this boats policy, and a lot of people are saying, you know, well, we need to look after our own. Before we put asylum seekers up in hotels, we need mm. to look after our own first, and asylum seekers are stopping us from doing that. Well, look what happens. Yeah, this is us looking after our own. I mean, I think this is just, it's just kind of vile, this policy. You know, the, fact, the definition of nuisance is so broad. It could mm. be anything from sleeping in a doorway mm. to having an excessive smell. And that would mean that you are potentially able to be criminalised under this policy, which includes a fine of up to two and a half thousand pounds, people sleeping on the streets. I think this all smacks of that horrible homelessness is a choice. Some people, you know, kind of lean into homelessness. It's I think, so, absolutely so, appalling. So what is going through the heads of these yeah. politicians mm. as we doing? approach a general election? This really seems like uh, fiddling whilst Rome mm. burns. There are much bigger issues, aren't there, yeah. for the Conservative Party to focus on if they actually want to make sure the electorate votes for I them. I completely agree. And I think this makes most people in this country really uncomfortable. I don't think there is a kind of vast wave of people in this country who find homelessness, you know, something that, you know, I, I, people are on the side of homelessness. I think we're very generous. I think we all feel, you know, it's deeply uncomfortable that we have a homelessness problem in this country. I don't think criminalising those people, calling them nuisances and moving them on is going to appeal to anyone at all. No. What are they thinking, Benedict? <laughs> but like, if I'm honest with you, yeah. I think that this is a policy that has been dreamt up by people who have spent far too much time in the centre of London. It comes from the same place as those who want to sort of scrap VAT for foreign tourists on luxury goods. Right. It's about giving the impression <laughs> that Britain is a, a nice country and everything works and we don't have... A, I think it's an almost purely aesthetic measure to basically rid the centre of London from a mm. lot of homeless people. And let's be clear, there are a lot more homeless people in the centre of London over the last few years. That's largely driven by, as we've said, you know, various 
economic reasons yeah. mm -hmm. uh, that has it means and that not people just London. To like, go to any yeah. city centre it, it, it drives me at the wall that people yeah. think that London's you know like the, got the is, worst mm. problem but but that everywhere. is I think what the motivation is because actually you know I remember when I lived in Liverpool there was a very large homelessness problem but this was not front and centre of the Tory yeah. party then it's now that it's become very much a central London issue mm. that they've gone oh we should probably do something well about it's in plain sight isn't it it comes That's from the why. same place yeah. as wanting to sort of ban American candy stores or those sort of annoying yeah. bikes that you know blare music <laughs> is that something that actually affects most people no but it's in the centre of London, so politicians see it and they think something should be done about right. it. Absolutely. Rebecca, let's move on, if we can, to a completely different story, front page of the Daily Star. Oh. Elvis fans are all spooked up. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Um, Why are you they? You thought Elvis had left the building, but he hasn't. <laughs> he has been potentially, I'm going to say potentially, yeah. haunting um, a hotel in Las Vegas where he had his residency, so the International Hotel. I've, I've not heard of it, but I'm sure it was very glamorous in his heyday. I'm sure. Which is where he had his residency, has reported um, that the sort of the ghostly essence of Elvis Presley is, is still around. Um, one man who stays there says, sometimes I say, Elvis, what's going on? The lights flicker. <gasps> Um, things move, <laughs> lamps turn on and off. I mean, if well, that is not concrete proof that Elvis is going to Adele, I don't know what You is. both laugh, but we, I swear, <laughs> had a ghost in the studio last week <laughs> was haunting me and Jeremy. Somebody mm -hmm. that knew Jeremy quite well. I believe we've got a little clip to show you. Anyone who is listening at home, um, the background of the studio, for some reason, keeps it's flickering changing. and changing colours. There's some grenons in the system Maybe that do ghosts. stick with us. Could be my mother who died, of course. She's probably telling me the show's rubbish. And oh, it's my goodness. On. But anyway, there we go. Oh, no! Yeah. Oh, God, if you just tuned in. Oh! We're, just, just to confirm, we are not in control of this. Mummy, don't do this to me. <laughs> Stop it, Mother. Oh I promise God. you I'm bathing myself. It's just her next to me. She gets the worst. Well, we're going to try and push on despite being haunted in the studio. If you're listening on the radio, my God, this is no good. He's such an errant child that Mother really is, still is still watching over him. <laughs> and rightly <laughs> so, in my opinion. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's um, terrifying. It was terrifying. <laughs> but actually, don't you think this will be a massive uh, draw for the tourists? Oh, saying, my I God. I want to go there because yes. Elvis is still in the absolutely. building. Absolutely. One final opportunity to, yes. can, to talk to the king. I get <laughs> it. When you have the exorcism, you could just have an Elvis impersonator with a dog collar singing glory, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you are wasted. You he need is. to be in a different career. Thank Elvis you. impersonator. Uh, I'm, I'm fine where I am. Oh, Nobody really, else really. Me. Thank you very much to both of you, to Rebecca and Benedict. They'll be back in just under an hour. Now, uh, you've been getting in touch with your views and opinions. We'll tell you what we're asking this morning. We're saying uh, that some Labour MPs are calling to ditch the union... Uh, flag, which we talked about earlier on, over fears it's alienating and associated with the far right. Do you think the union flag, or union jack, as it's colloquially called, is divisive? Uh, Darren says, what's stopping us from charging these MPs with treason? I dare anyone to go to any country in the world and just speak about removing their flag. They would get their answers there and then, and clearly we've been far too... And just to clarify, this is removing the flag of their brochures for the uh, the election campaign, uh, not removing it entirely. Uh, Paula says anyone in the Labour Party objecting to the Union Jack should be thrown out of politics altogether. Brianna says Labour is truly sick and pathetic if it's attacking the Union Jack. Sick, sick, sick. Well, uh, we also know the Prime Minister is coming under increasing pressure. Should he call the general election now? Should he wait? When's the date? What do you think the date of that election should be? Uh, let us know your thoughts, please. You can email us talk today at talk.tv. You can tweet us at talk.tv. You can also text the word talk and your message to 8732. Well, still to come, Kinsey joins us with all the latest on the Royals. Good morning, Kinsey. Good morning, Nick and David. A unified front from the royal family this Easter holiday, led by King Charles himself. What he told one well-wisher about his health. Plus, Harry and Meghan are likely headed back to the UK. All that and more coming up next. This is Talk Today. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman. Trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. Was supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 6.50 now. The King and Queen greeted crowds of well-wishers yesterday at the Easter service. The annual mass ran at a reduced capacity as members of the royal family recuperate, uh, indeed, from cancer. Well, doctors had advised the King to avoid the risks associated with larger crowds, meaning some minor royals sat out of this year's service. Well, joining us now is royal commentator and host of the To Die For Daily podcast, Kinsey Schofield. Welcome, Kins. Now, the King seemed to be in high spirits greeting the crowds yesterday. Can you tell us a little bit more about Charles's appearance? Yeah, well, one of my favorite lines, and I think it's actually in front of you on the cover of The Express, was when somebody wished him well, and he said, I'm doing my best. You know, it, you know you're getting that, that great sense of his sweet sense of humor um, that him and Camilla, you know, their, their sense of humor seems to be so, yes, <laughs> I'm doing my best, seems to be so dry. Uh, but, you know, just engaging with those people, uh, we, we were under the impression that he wouldn't actually go as far as to shake hands and touch people because of his you know immune system being potentially jeopardized by some of these cancer treatments that he's undergoing so what a thrill to see him out and about smiling shaking hands and and just really engaging with people that were there to wish him well and to spend such a sacred holiday with him I, I think that's absolutely right. And, and actually, the outpouring of love and affection for the king from, from many people, in fact, from loads of people in this country and around the world, has been really humbling in many ways. And you can see that the king takes this very personally. He takes mm. his, his job extremely seriously. Oh, yes. And with such devastating news that we received from the Princess of Wales not too long ago, I think it was important for him to get back and, and be the face of the family as much as he can to give us a sense of relief. I mean, we, we've spoken a lot over the last few weeks about how vulnerable uh, the royal family can be um, over the last few weeks. It just it has seemed very vulnerable or the idea of the queen saying, you know, you need to be seen to be believed. And obviously, Obviously, they hear that they're listening and and they're they're trying to put on a, a really strong and courageous front. And that's absolutely what it looks like. 
And Kinsey, in the absence of the Prince and Princess of Wales, it appeared as though Prince Andrew had a larger role than we would normally expect. I believe he, he greeted Charles and Camilla into the church. Where do you see the role of Prince Andrew playing out? We're told that he's never gonna return to public life as it was before, and yet he's front and center at these kinds of events. Nicola, I, the, I don't, I am so lost when it comes to <laughs> this PR strategy. I, you know, I feel like, I, a part of me feels like they're, he's trying to support his family and, and he wants Prince Andrew around because it was important to Queen Elizabeth. They've slapped him on the wrist. He's no longer a, you know, a working member of the royal family, but he will always be a family member. Um, and you know they, they can't take that away from mm. him. So I, I am that's one of the, the big puzzles when it comes to my mind PR wise, but uh, he is a, a loved, very loved member of their family. Well, I I think it's also, Kinsey, it's protocol as well. I think one of the other things that, that uh, ha has transpired, the king was very, very keen to slim down the royal family, to have fewer working royals. Now, the problem with that, as we've now seen, is there aren't very many of them. Mm. You've got the king, the queen, the prince and princess of Wales, the duke and duchess of Edinburgh, the princess royal, who is a complete stalwart. But the others that are involved, the duke of Kent is 88, the princess Alexandra of Kent is 87, and the duke and duchess of Gloucester are 79 and 77. So there is a real problem here in terms of trying to divvy up the work and making sure there are enough working royals to go round. And I think that those conversations happened decades ago when he initially talked about slimming down the monarchy. Uh, the slimmed down monarchy we see today are unfortunate circumstances between Pri Prince Andrew and Prince Harry. I'm under the impression that Prince Harry was always going to be under the umbrella of the slimmed down monarchy, especially because he was a rock star in his prime and uh, people absolutely loved uh, Prince Harry. So I think that this is not this is not the slim down monarchy that King Charles had suggested when he was Prince Charles. These are unfortunate circumstances that, you know, have I hate to use this word again, have left them vulnerable. It's fascinating, isn't it? And well, Harry, speaking of Harry, him and Meghan may return to the UK for the Invictus Games. Is there any any uh, proposed meetups between the family? We know that Harry obviously flew back following his father's cancer diagnosis for, for a very short meeting, but could they be back again just very, very quickly? Yeah, two exciting developments. You know, they could be back in May for the 10-year 10, 10 anniversary, but Invictus Games could be hosted in the UK in 2027. Prince Harry's team is allegedly in very serious discussions with the government about a triumphant return. Amazing. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Kinsey, for joining us as always, and happy Easter. Well, lots more still to come on Talk Today. It's bills, bills, bills for Britain as prices change across the board with everything from the energy price cap to TV licenses set to shift. But is this good news for our bank balances? This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. <laughs>、Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning、um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying、um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite、um, right, too. Yay, Quite yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> What just happened? <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs>
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement. If you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Nicola Thorpe. A very good morning to you. It is 7 o'clock on Monday, the 1st of April. Yeah, we talk today on TV, radio, online, and, of course, on your smart speaker. Your top stories this morning. Electoral wipeout. The Conservative Party faces its worst defeat in history, according to a new mega poll, with the Prime Minister's own seat at risk. Killer delays. More than 250 patients are dying every week due to long waits for A&E care. And time to rebudget. The energy price cap falls today, but other expenses are going up. We'll speak to experts to explain what that means for your money. And we've got three areas of weather across the country today. Sadly, none of them are particularly good, but I will have all the details coming up shortly. Super, thank you very much indeed, uh, Joe. Keep all your messages coming in, please. The general election, when is it? When should Rishi Sunak call it? Let us know. Now, though, it's time for your headlines with Katie. Thank you, David. Good morning. Hundreds of patients have died unnecessarily each week in England due to any waits. Well, that's the finding of a shocking new study from the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. It found there was likely to be an excess death for every 72 patients who spent 8 to 12 hours in the emergency department. And the longer the wait, the greater risk of death. Households already struggling in the cost of living crisis are facing even more pressure. From today, seven major household bills are going up. Regular bills like council tax and water will rise. So will broadband and mobile phone costs. The good news is the new energy price cap comes into effect. That means from today, energy bills will fall. But there's some good news for millions of lower paid workers. The government's increased the minimum wage for more than a pound for the first time. The national living wage is rising from £10.42 an hour to £11.44. It's a pay rise of £1,100 a year. Scotland's new hate crime laws have come into force. New offences have been introduced for stirring up hatred based on prejudice towards protected characteristics. Well, they include age, disability, religion, sexual orientation and gender. And the expected star, Lucy Spragan, has announced that Simon Cow will walk her down the aisle when she marries Amelia Smith in June. Spragan left the show in 2012 under difficult circumstances and became friends with the judge years later. She told The Sun she asked him if he'd give her away before they went swimming in the sea together. He said it would be an honour. 
Those are the headlines. I'll be back in about an hour's time. Thanks, Katie. Imagine Simon Cowell walking you down the <laughs> aisle. Amazing. I think it would be amazing. Showbiz or what? Well, yeah, very it's, showbiz. it's very showbiz. I wonder if he'd be super judgmental at the of end. Of course he would. Well. He'd be like, what yeah. are you wearing? Yeah, what on earth is this? <laughs> yeah. He's allowed. He's Simon Cowell. Come on. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Right, right. Thank you so much, Katie. Well, we have been asking you this morning uh, because the Prime Minister is under pressure to call a general election. Have you already made up your mind as to who you're voting for. Uh, Sephora says, I voted Conservative all my life, but not anymore. They deserve absolutely everything that's coming to them. Yeah, Thomas says, for the first time in my entire 40 years of voting, I won't be voting Conservative and I won't be voting Labour and I never will. The only party that seems to make any sense is reform, so I'm prepared to give them a chance. Deborah says, I'm a hardcore Tory voter, but this time it won't be for Rishi and his version of the Conservative Party. So some very damning comments there about Rishi Sunak and about the Conservative Party. And the big question, I suppose, is when that election is going to be called. And he is kind of damned whether he does it now or whether he waits until later. And he's hoping the economy improves, the boats stop, uh, sure. he can actually get on top but of everything. Even if those things happen, will that change the outcome at the election? I'm not so convinced. Well, also, we need to wait for Labour to see their manifesto as well. So uh, I think it's still all to play for. It's going to be very interesting. I think though. they could possibly put whatever they liked in the manifesto and it wouldn't make a difference. Well, let's see. Well, on to our top story today. New bombshell polling suggests that the Tories could be left with just 98 members of Parliament. Yes, forecasting the worst ever Conservative Party defeat in history. 14 serving ministers and even the Prime Minister himself, Rishi Sunak, could lose their seats. Well, political commentator Matthew Stadlin is still with us this morning. And we're also joined by The Telegraph's Poppy Coburn down the line. Good morning to you both. Poppy, I'm going to come to you first. Do you think there's any chance of the Tories turning things around before the election? Um, I think if this poll is any more um, accurate, which I personally think it is, then no. We're actually not just talking about a wipeout at the general election. We're talking about the end of the party altogether. I mean, if the Conservative Party does worse than they did in 1906, they got 156 seats then. We're now talking about double digits. It's over. This is also a possibility where all of the front benches, including the prime minister himself, are gone. And that also means all of the people, the runners and riders potentially, to take over as the next leader of the party, and that would be leader of the opposition, are also all gone, apart from Kemi Badnock. So it won't be a very exciting competition if that does happen. But there's no way that they can bring this back from the brink if they're already here. This is about mitigating losses. This is about trying to keep as many MPs as they possibly can. But the public have clearly just given up. And Matthew, these figures are so damning. Labour on 45%, Conservatives 26%, Lib Dems 10.4%, Reform 8.5%. I mean, there is a lot of arguing going on, blame, attribution of blame um, amongst the Conservative Party themselves. Even if he survives, let's say, and we were talking earlier about a no-confidence vote, even if he survives that, uh, a leading rebel organiser has says, you know, could you imagine, he goes into the campaign saying, vote for me, don't vote for this lot, even though they don't like me. I mean, the whole thing would be absolutely extraordinary. It's a complete mess for the Conservatives. I mean, you said just a moment ago, didn't you, that it's still all to play for. Is it really I'm putting both sides of it. Well, I'm putting both sides what of is, it. What is true is that a week is a long time in politics, and therefore a few months is quite a substantial time in politics. I think the main problem for this Conservative government and for Rishi Sunak is not Keir Starmer, although he's done a reasonable job as Labour leader, it's not the Labour Party, it's the fact that 14 years is an absolute age in politics. Yeah. And people have had enough. People have, have stopped listening. And Poppy, do you think we could even see a situation by this time next year where the Tory party aren't even the opposition party? If this poll is correct, that's the end of the Conservative Party. There's no way that they're coming back from this. If they have 98 seats, worst case scenario, they lose their prime minister. I mean, this isn't just having a Michael Portillo moment. This is your entire party being completely wiped out. And it's not like the party is even unified here. I mean, there have been talk about replacing the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak with somebody else. They can't even figure out who they actually mm. want. They don't know when they want an election. They don't know who they want to lead the party. They don't know what policies they want to lead the party. This is complete extinction level of event. And, and Matthew, Poppy just says it's an extinction-level event, and I would agree with her, actually. There, there was a lovely line from one of uh, the ministers saying, well, Rishi's selling point was supposed to be that he was a bit rubbish at politics, but he was good at governing. And it turns out he's actually not very good at that either. <laughs> yeah, the, the problems are mounting up. I actually don't think... I'm a left-leaning commentator, as you know. I, I do not think it would be good for 
democracy in this country if the Tories are wiped out to that extent? Because Agreed. as well as a robust media, and it's not always been that robust in holding the Tories to account, we do need a robust opposition. So if they end up with fewer than 100 seats, and I don't think this will happen, but if they do, that is not a good thing. Will they still be the official opposition? Of course they will be. Well, that's not what Poppy says. Poppy also, just in terms of Rishi Sunak, apparently he is miserable, he's snappy, uh, people are saying he's hangry because he's <laughs> fasting, so he's angry, he has low blood glucose, and apparently the mood uh, amongst the Conservatives is, is dire. Well, people that, people that I've spoken to who are around the Prime Minister seem to say the same sort of thing. I mean, the problem is... <laughs> He's apparently been going around asking people. I, I heard it's an interview a few weeks ago. Am I doing a good job? What am I doing wrong? Yeah. I don't really understand. And I completely agree with what Matthew just said. He's supposed to be the competent, uh, you know, get rid of Liz Truss. Liz Truss is so popular for disaster. Boris is kicked out. Don't worry. Rishi Sunak is someone that will steadily rise in the polls. You've seen the opposite happen. You've seen him steadily drop, drop, drop. Nobody wants another leadership contest. Everybody knows that it would be disastrous. Everybody knows getting a third leader in who's not Democrat elected by the general public would be an embarrassment. Because he's performing so badly, even people who know that this is a terrible idea are going, well, surely it can't be any worse. <laughs> if we're polling to get 98 seats at the general election, we just need to go with whatever works. I mean, this is panic mode now. It's absolutely horrendous for the Prime Minister. I imagine, you know, he's only human. He probably feels awful about it. And Poppy, what do you think the prospects are for the Reform Party? They're obviously polling quite well at the moment. Um, I think that they will probably exceed expectations, even considering their polling being very good. And the reason for that is it's so easy to outflank the Conservative Party from the right at the moment. You know, before, when we've seen a right-wing challenge to the Conservatives, there's always been a last-minute stand-down. Uh, this is like the Brexit Party, for example, saying, well, we've kind of got what we wanted, the party saying what we want them to say, so we're not going to contest this number of seats. I don't think that's going to happen this time. I imagine that Richard Tice, the leader of the Reform Party, is gunning for the end of the Conservative Party altogether and maybe has mind of becoming his own right-wing opposition party. I think that this is going to be one of the major points that really, really, really damages them. They are just so vulnerable from their right flank because they haven't really delivered any serious right-wing policies. They've certainly said right-wing things. They haven't actually followed through on anything. You know, they've tracked their electoral strategy on stopping the boats. Well, they haven't done that. And when the summer comes, we'll probably see the highest level of boat crossings we've seen in recorded history. So that's just something that the longer they put this election off, the more likely it is that right-wing challenge becomes extremely strong and difficult and, to... And we're starting to see that, Poppy, aren't we? We're starting to see the Conservative Party turning on reform, saying, you need to stand down. Well, I'll tell you what, the reform stood down last time, giving the Conservative Party an 80-seat majority. Well, the Richard, Brexit Party, the Brexit Party, uh, the re reform being the reincarnation of that. Richard Tice has been very clear that is not happening this time. No, I've got and actually, to... he says it's time the Conservatives stood down for reform. I've got to know Richard a little bit through TV appearances. He and Nigel Farage are absolutely determined, I think, to smash the Tories this time. As you rightly say, they helped Boris Johnson. They helped him a little bit towards his majority of 80 last time. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because people like me are attacking the Tories from the left. People like Richard Tice are attacking the Tories from the right. One of the things that I think will help Labour is that the left of politics in this country, I suspect, when it comes to the election, will vote tactically. Whereas on the right, there is a real risk. I don't think it will be as substantial as the polls suggest, but there is a real risk for the Tories that reform will take some of their votes. One of the really interesting things in the Sunday Times piece yesterday, which was the sort of home of this big poll, this 15,000 people survey, is that it's said that Rishi Sunak, and this is sort of gossip, but that he's not, he's not de decisive. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you rule you have to be able to make decisions and you have to be able to make them reasonably quickly. Yes, of course he's very clever, but he sort of is said to be seeing things on the one hand, on the other hand, and then trying to triangulate. That is not the recipe for being a successful prime minister. Well, I want to get the reaction of both of you from uh, two, sorry, this front page story, the Mail and the Times this morning, that killer NHS waiting lists are killing over 250 patients a week, Poppy, who may have died for no reason other than simply being in a waiting, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, a waiting time in, in A&E departments. What's your response to that, Poppy? 
I mean, this is just absolutely disastrous. I think I saw, a, a, I read a stat earlier, it was one in 72 patients is at risk of an excess death. And the longer they're actually in the ward, the higher their possibility of dying actually becomes, which is absolutely the opposite of what you want to be hearing. You want to be thinking when you're in the A&E ward, you're going to be safer. But a friend of mine had to go to A&E recently and said it was just unbelievable. This, the, just There's not enough staff around. There are people sitting out in the corridor, the waits are over 12 hours, if you're lucky. I think it probably shows that we cannot just wait until the election to put off the crisis in the NHS. Funding is obviously an issue, but also this is a long consequence of the COVID lockdowns. We have a massive backlog of patients here who are actually going to A&E more than they would before because they can't get normal treatment. So they can't actually see a GP. So they're putting um, off getting seen by a doctor to the extent when they now need to use emergency services, which is massively adding to the pressure here. But, um, but this is this is crisis mode. I mean, the government needs to have an urgent intervention. They cannot just wait and go, what, well, but, Labour will but, be Poppy, what would that look like? And also, if Labour gets in, what, what on earth can Labour do about it? Because you say, actually, the funding is there. But when you look at it, we don't have enough beds. We don't have enough doctors. The whole system is actually falling apart. Well, well, that's a difficult question. And I actually think Wes Streeting, who is the Labour Shadow Health Minister, has been pretty open about the problems the NHS is facing. He said that, look, it's not going to be when a Labour government gets in, everything's fixed up. But I, I, I will say, um, you know, the funding issue is that the funding issue is very real. Um, there was another six billion pounds that was given to the NHS during the budget, but that is still not enough to fix the NHS. Perhaps should start some questions rolling in people's minds. Well, just how much is it going to cost to prop up the service? You know, we're an aging country. We have a lot of people who are out of work and long-term sickness. It's increasingly difficult to sustain that in public funding. But we cannot have a situation where A&E is not working. I mean, this is just disastrous. But people cannot help but go to A&E. This is not just having a backlog with GPs. This is people who have got serious life-threatening illnesses who are dying because they cannot see an emergency doctor in time. Some kind of intervention needs to happen. And I, I, unfortunately, I can't give you an answer where that would be. And I'd say that probably very few people in the country can. I, I think very quickly, the, the, the most important thing here is the human cost, that mm. people are actually dying because they are not being processed through A&E quickly enough. The 76% target to get 76 no of people put, through in four no hours. there's to put them. There is, there is a real issue here. There isn't enough money, even though we are putting a lot of money in. If well, you talk to the, you well, in? if you talk to the experts, we need an extra sort of 3.5% a year. Labour aren't offering that. Mm. Uh, in, in, mm. Over the last hour or so, I've been looking at more detail at Labour's plan. It, it doesn't wildly excite me. They want two, two million more appointments, I think, in their first year. But one of the ways they want to fund this is through the scrapping of the nom-dom tax breaks. Which but the Tories, for everything else. Everything. But also the Tories have already done this now, haven't yes. they? They've already promised this in their budget. So, look, I just hope that we are going to get a more competent Labour government. Are they going to have a magic money tree? No, they're not. But politically, headlines like this, long waits in A&E, kill 250 people every week in The Times, disastrous for Sunak because he's staked his reputation partly on driving waiting lists down and he is failing. Well, thank you so much to Poppy Coburn down the line there and Matthew Sutherland joining us in the studio. Let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages now. Yeah, let's start with the uh, the mail. It leads uh, with those new figures showing hundreds of needless deaths occurred on a weekly basis last year in England due to agonising wait times on A&E wards. In The Telegraph, we're told that three quarters of England's second homeowners are set to be charged double council tax next year, a move affecting 130,000 properties. And finally, The Sun says return of the king as Charles is photographed waving at well wishes outside St George's Chapel this Easter weekend. Moving on now, our bills are set for an overhaul from today, with the energy price cap dropping, the national living wage rising and TV licences increasing. Well, joining us now is Times uh, Money Mentors, Georgie Frost. Georgie, really good to talk to you this morning. A very happy Easter to you. Shall we start with the energy price cap? Because this is a bit of good news. I think it's a terrible misnomer, of course. It's, it's not really a cap. It's a cap on, on the unit of energy that mm. you're using. But we're seeing it going down significantly. That has to be some good news. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Good morning. Happy Easter, everyone. Uh, let's not look, I suppose, a gift horse in the mouth here. I mean, when everything else is going up, it is quite nice that things are going down, but just at a time when we're probably likely, hopefully, fingers crossed, to be using less energy because it's going to, hopefully, fingers crossed, <laughs> get sunnier and warmer. Um, but yes, look, it's gone down 12%, 12.3%. So it is, it is falling down, and that is good news. Excuse the dogs in the background. 
but yeah, that, that is good news. However, that it's still substantially higher than it was. And you're absolutely right to point out that this is an average of unit use. So if you have a big house, lots of kids running around, it's a leaky house, then likely you'll be using more because you'll look at this figure of the average of about 1,600 that it's dropping to and think, I don't pay anywhere near that. Mine is much higher. Um, but alas, it is the amount of energy used. So if you use more, you'll pay more. Georgie, moving on now to the national living wage, which has increased by around about a pound. Are we going to see, obviously that's great news for people who are, uh, who this applies to, people will have their wage packets increasing, but is this going to have a knock on effect for consumers? Will this therefore increase the prices of, you know, is it inflationary? Uh I think it's a watch and see. That's certainly what the Bank of England will be looking at. I know when this was announced last year that there were a lot of nervous businesses with business rates going up and a cost of living crisis and the pandemic that they're still recovering from to see an extra amount of money that they need to pay their workers. Now, I'm a fully behind paying people what they're absolutely deserved to, to be paid. So that's that's not a, a political statement there. That's just what businesses will be feeling right now. Certainly the Bank of England will have been looking at this. And there's been a lot of speculation about whether they would lower interest rates. I mean, I, I wasn't convinced they would have done anyway, but they'll certainly look at how things like this play out over the next couple of months. How will businesses be able to absorb this? Because, of course, if as a business you have to pay your staff more, where are you going to get that money from? Presumably, you'd have to raise the price of your goods, therefore raising the cost of living, raising inflation. And, of course, Georgie, this is deeply political. Rishi Sunak will hope that actually raising the minimum wage will, will help him and the party's fortunes. But as you rightly say, I think at the end of the day, when it comes to the general election, people will be looking at their mortgages. They'll be looking at the interest rates. They'll be saying, do I feel better off? David, they'll be looking, as you said, at their council tax. They'll be looking at their water bills. They'll be looking at their broadband. They'll be looking at the pounds left in their pocket at the end of the week and realising they've got substantially less over the last, uh, certainly few years, but the last 14 years. So, yes, look, this was a, a promise made by the Conservatives about getting people paid more. You know, there are national insurance cuts. The, we saw the first cut for employed people come in in January and it didn't move the dial at all. Now, I'm a personal finance journalist, so I'll tell you about all the bits and bobs and you've got political political journalists who'll do a better job than me about what impact this will have. However, look, I, I, it's sort of a sense of too little, too late. Absolutely. And what about TV licences, Georgie? What can you tell us? They are increasing. But we I heard last week that there was potentially set to be um, different ways in which people can can pay. Sorry, different. What do I mean? Different pay. Um, pay bands. Thank pay you. Bands, yes, or levels of pay. Yes. <laughs> different levels of pay for different people. So it might be increasing for some, but not for others. It is one of the things that I could be wrong, but I think it's something like the, most, the biggest reason people end up in court is not paying their TV license. It's, it's actually very controversial. People are trying to find they're trying to find ways in which we can get round it. You know, over 75s have to pay those sorts of things. Look, it just adds to the pot. Basically, all the things that are going up, I didn't mention car tax, you know, look at the poor, poor people in Birmingham with a 21% mm. rise in council tax, stamps are going up. I mean, it, it just feels at the moment absolutely endless. We used to call this awful April because yeah. it was when price, price hikes went mm. up. But look, we do have, of course, uh, minimum wage going up. We have some better news, national insurance cut for employed and self-employed, state pension going up by the second largest rise on records benefit fits going up. Now, I'm not saying, you know, it's all good news and it sort of counters the bad news. It's a real mixed bag and it really depends on, on how you earn, how you spend your money as to whether you'll feel better off at the end of the month. My sense is you possibly won't. But you started with some good news, so I want to end with some good news. Energy bills are going down and the sun looks like it's about to shine <laughs> today. So Ever the optimist, take, ever the optimist. Take the good news where we can find it. <laughs> Georgie, thank you so much. That's Georgie Frost there. Still to come on Talk Today, scorched earth immigration policies mean universities could be reliant on students from China and why the price of chocolate is rising. No. Well, Rebecca Hudson from the News Movement and Conservative commentator Benedict Spencer here to look through this morning's papers with us. This is Talk Today. It's 7.21. Good morning.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to... <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 7.24. We'll have the weather for you in just a moment. But here's what else is coming up in the programme. Well, we're hearing from two sisters who have spent the last 10 years collecting Easter eggs to donate to charity. That's at quarter to eight. Plus, with the energy price cap set to fall by 12% today, we're asking what that means for your bills. And would you want to live forever? Well, new AI technology is offering the chance to be immortalised as a digital avatar. More on that at 10 past nine. Sounds dreadful. Yeah. Joe, uh, talking of dreadful, uh, shall, we, shall we look at the weather? Joe is not uh, dreadful. <laughs> no, you're not dreadful. <laughs> but I assume the weather, it's a bank holiday, the weather probably is. It, is. It's shocking. Oh, it's, great. It's so yeah. bad, it, honestly. Yeah. Uh, we'd lovely to see some sunshine. It is now official. British summertime. The clocks went forward, but uh, frankly, the weather, no. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Having said that, the temperatures did top 17 degrees Celsius yesterday, so at least it's not too cold. But as you look at the pressure charts, just area after area of low pressure. So through the rest of the week, we're going to see showers, longer spells of rain, and then just for the weekend, we'll see a spell of very wet, very windy weather as well. So all that to come is just going to be unsettled over the next few days. And certainly for today, we've really got three areas of weather, starting with Scotland, where we'll probably see the best of the weather, northwestern parts of Scotland. Through central areas, it is going to be very gloomy. A lot of cloud, low cloud, misty, foggy conditions. If you're driving, a lot of rain around, that's going to give surface water and also a lot of spray. So really quite unpleasant 
for those areas. And that rain is edging its way northwards into Northern Ireland, southern parts of Scotland. So to the south, this is where it'll be fairly mild. And if you get out of the showers, well, we could see 15, 16 degrees Celsius. But those showers, where they happen, could be heavy, could be thundery. And so as we go into this evening and overnight, we do so with temperatures, as I say, for most of us in double figures, the mid-teens for some. We still continue to see some showers. Those will tend to die away overnight, but they persist along southernmost coasts. And that uh, rain over Scotland really just starts to rotate, making its way back into Northern Ireland. Still slightly cooler, slightly clearer for the far north there, but feeling chilly in that northeasterly wind. And then uh, as we go through tomorrow, we start with temperatures not too bad. Could see a touch of frost in the far north, but that's about it. Still very gloomy over Scotland. Bits and pieces of rain as well and that strong northeasterly wind. Elsewhere, we've got the showers. Again, sunny spells and showers. Those tend to die out through central areas through the afternoon only because we see another area of rain making its way in from the southwest. So no particular place gets uh, the better or the worse weather tomorrow. It's wet in the north, wet in the southwest, sunshine and showers through those central areas. And once again, temperature is going to be about average for the time of year. We're looking at 13 or 14 degrees Celsius only. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thanks very much, Joe. Conservative commentator Benedict Spence and the news movement's Rebecca Hudson are here with us for a look through this morning's papers. Benedict, let's start with the front page of The Guardian, if we can. The headline here is Cuts Force Universities to rely on Chinese students. There's been a huge pushback, as we know, about immigration, about the graduate visa route, bringing in your relatives if you come and study in this country. This is taking a completely different tack. Yeah, if we if we uh, cut down on all of these other students, then we're going to rely entirely on the money that's brought in by overseas students from China. They do actually make up a very large uh, percentage of that market, but there are many controversies that come with that. Um, I think first and foremost, we have to say that it's a real sign of quite what a bad situation the university sector is, that we have to rely actually on bringing in uh, people from overseas. That wasn't what universities initially were for um, you know, about creating a culture of excellence and even the move to create a situation where 50% of school leavers went to university in this country was not about turning universities into effectively giant um, accreditation factories, which is very often what they are now uh, with a lot of these overseas students. And in fact, you know, just limiting it to Chinese students uh, doesn't solve that issue because a lot of Chinese students come here for that reason as well. There was, of course, the uh, the story recently in the Times uh, uh, to do with plagiarism and the amount of cheating that was going on mm -hmm. um, with overseas students, but specifically about uh, Chinese overseas students. And that is because ultimately they bring in a lot of money, so we're more than happy to have them because they pay for things that other people can't currently afford to pay for because we aren't going to raise the uh, current uh, re levels of tuition fees for people in this country. Uh, they get rubber stamped uh, a, a degree in things like town planning or things like that. Very often, actually, courses that people from this country are told not to apply for because they're told that's what that is there for. That's for people to come from overseas. They don't necessarily do all the work because they pay other people to do the work for them. Then they go back to China, <laughs> at which point they have a degree from a Western university. Yep. And then they are able to enter the jobs market at a higher rate than people who are not wealthy enough to go to a Western university. So it's a scam on people from China coming here. It's a scam on our own university sector. But that is now how we fund and are able to subsidize people going to university in this country. I don't think it's particularly fair. But there we are. That's what we've decided to do. We've decided to marketize our universities like we have in the United States. But we are just going to pay less than what people pay for all of them in the United States. Uh, and it's just not really a system that's working effectively well, is it? I think some overseas students do do the work. Don't you think? I don't think they're all no, cheating. I, I think I we, I'm sure some of them are, 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 <laughs> are very I'm committed I'm generalizing, but the rates yeah. of plagiarism amongst Chinese students, we should not laugh this off. The amount of plagiarism that goes on, from especially from Chinese students, I mean, that's a, that, I mean, that's a different <laughs> argument, because we're actually talking about the amount of money people are paying to go mm. to university. I actually think one of the biggest issues was saying 50% of people should go to university. I'd rather people went and became apprentices for, mm. for great jobs, that skills in this country. I always kind of struggle with that because I think absolutely not not everyone needs to go to, to university, no. but there is also this argument that then the only people that get to go are sort of, you know, wealthy middle class kids to go sure. and study certain certain kinds of subjects and it slightly does reinforce the class structure and everyone should enjoy those kind of couple of years away from home. It's such an education in lots of other ways apart from just what you're learning. But the but that sort of snobbery that unless you have a degree, your qualifications aren't work, worth much, I think is also something we should yeah. step away from. But once yes. upon a time, that wasn't the case in this country. You didn't need to have gone 
gone to university to actually get on in life. And uh, apart from things like engineering or medicine, actually very often people do not need to go to university. But what they're told, and what great swathes of people are told now, 50% mm -hmm. approaching, is that you need to go to university to get on in life. That means going to a place where you don't necessarily know, you've never been before, you don't know the first thing about it, and taking on huge amounts of debt that initially you were told you'd never pay any interest on, but ha, ah, they changed the rules on that. But this all it's not a fair back. system. This all links back to building houses, infrastructure in this sure. country. If we mm. need we need plumbers and electricians, carpenters, we mm. need all mm -hmm. of these things. And you can earn a very good wage doing that. We yeah. need to re-educate the, the country on what it is to be a, a, mm. a skilled tradesman. Benedict, mm. I don't know what you're talking about. My three-year degree in acting <laughs> has done me very well. I can play well, a tree has. in all different seasons. <laughs> well, it, has. Oh, yeah. it has in a way. Yes. Also, the debt that yeah. I accrued from, yeah. from that time at, at, at drama school was is astounding. I'm still paying it off. I have to be honest. I don't even I, look at it because I, I don't. Yeah, if I could go back in time, I'd tell my younger self not to bother to go to university in this country. I'd say there are certain courses and certain universities that it is worth going to. But sadly, I say certain universities. That's not because of what you learn. That's because of the networking opportunities that it gives you. Yes. If you go to Oxford or Cambridge, it's yeah. who you meet, not what you end up learning. That's a broken system yeah. by anybody's mm. measure. Absolutely. Well, we're going to move on now to a story in The Times. A referendum on immigration could shore up Tory votes. What kind of referendum would it be? Uh, well, this is specifically uh, a ref well, this is polling that's been done of people who have left the Tory party to vote potentially for the Reform Party. Um, it would be, I suppose, I don't entirely understand what it is that we'd be saying. Are we, <laughs> no, no. Are we going to well, no, well, this is the important thing. Are we going to have, is this a moratorium on all, ref uh, on all immigration? Is it going to be EU uh, migration? Is it going to be non-EU migration? But what this poll is saying is that people that have gone over to the Reform Party, 42% of them could be tempted back to the Tory party if there were a referendum on immigration. So what's the now, does anybody think that that's... the referendum going to say? Do you want exactly, to see less immigration? That's exactly answer, the thing. Yes, it's that's an, what people well, say. It's a bit like saying, do you want to leave the European Union? <laughs> yes or no? Like, what, what, how? What, 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 yeah, what version? That doesn't matter. We're just not... Yeah, do you like it? Do you not? Yeah. Uh, and that's not a particularly helpful thing. It's also, I think, a bit short-sighted in that this is talking about specifically ex-Tory voters who have gone over to reform. It doesn't talk about Labour voters. You know, sure. you know, immigration mm. is not necessarily a massively popular... Um, a policy amongst a lot of Labour voters. That's why a lot of them ended up going over to Boris Johnson uh, at the last general election. But this is juxtaposed in the Times with the story that's underneath it, uh, which says, make migrant citizens Labour told, which is supposedly uh, that, the, uh, that a Labour think tank has said that EU citizens should be given British citizenship under the Labour Party, that that would go down particularly well. And I just... <laughs> you're laughing and that's kind of the thing it's kind of like so we've got on the one hand we're being told if we just have you know absolute cessation on all immigrations that'll be really good for the Tories and Labour also being told if you let people in and you make them citizens really quickly that'll be really popular as well it's almost like we don't entirely know where we stand <laughs> on this there's a surprise Rebecca <laughs> just in terms of that um, the, the, the government Rishi Sunak says he's going to stop the boats well Yes, there are a lot of people coming across, 5,000. Mm. It's nothing compared to the three quarters of a million people that he's allowed on his watch into this country. And that is what people are cross about. Yeah, I think, I think you're exactly right. And I think we kind of, it all gets slightly conflated, doesn't it? In terms of, we talk about immigration, but you're right. We have this vast numbers of people who are coming here as kind of economic migrants rather than the people um, in the small boats. And I think that is why the, the Labour policy does make a little bit of sense in that it would allow those people while you're waiting to have your claims process, et cetera, to contribute to the economy. So that at least, you know, we've got this, people, are, you know, there's, there's not the idea that we're kind of spending lots of money to, su with, to support without mm -hmm. that money then being reinvested in all these people working. It kind of frees them up. Um, but I, And also the, the idea of this referendum just shows the, how tricky it is for the, the Tories. You know, one minute we talk mm -hmm. about them taxing people with second homes because they sort of need to figure <laughs> that out. But then equally like, oh, but we'll do a referendum on, on immigration. It just shows that they, just how schizophrenic their policies are going into this election. But also, what does it do for the Conservative Party? They know the answer. They know what people think about immigration. They yeah. know they have to stop the boats. So what does the what referendum... What are they going to do about well, it? Well, yeah, exactly, that's well, exactly. the point. None of this is particularly news because at every general election since time immemorial, the Conservatives have promised to reduce immigration and every time that people have voted for them, they've then raised the levels of immigration. So as you say, this is not news that Conservative voters do not like that. And this is also what it's framed as. You know, Nobody likes the levels of illegal immigration to this country, but actually the great big sort of 
unspoken thing is that people are really ticked off with the amount of legal immigration that the Tories have significantly seen a rise in because it suppresses wages, because it puts stress on the system that the government then doesn't invest into expanding so it can't meet demand. And that is why when you have a population growth of 10 million, you mm. don't, can't actually see a GP because there aren't enough GPs because mm. we haven't invested in the infrastructure. Exactly. So mm. round we go. Mm. Exactly. Right, let's move on mm. to a different story now, Becca. In the mail, youngsters are so addicted to social media that they suffer withdrawal symptoms when it's taken away from them. Mm. This is I this is a really interesting story. So social media use has increased tenfold over the last decade, obviously, because we've now got them at the touch of a button. You know, everyone's carrying these things around their devices day in, day out. And this new report saying that the amount of, that, that sort of when you try and take phones off young people, Benedict. they experience... Yeah. Focus. <laughs> Benedict, focus. No, no, it said young people. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop policing yeah. me. Oh. <laughs> Um, they experience the same kind of withdrawal <laughs> symptoms that you would if you were um, withdrawing from a drug. So, you know, you kind of get this paranoia, this anxiety, um, but equally, social media use is linked to depression, um, another form of social anxiety, body dysmorphia. So it's this kind of impossible thing that we, you know, social media is not going anywhere, is it? Sure. Um, we know that it can be harmful if it's not used in the right way, but what do we do about it? Probably educate people to have a healthy relationship mm. with it. I well, I'm no doctor, but I have one sat well, next have to one me. Here. Mm. Now, Addiction. Now, I understand that there are certain drugs and chemicals that you can be chemically addicted to, but with something like social media, I imagine it's the dopamine yes, hit that is. you get from it seeing is. a notification or getting a yeah. message, and, and that's what you're addicted to. I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it? So the kids, you're right, it's a quick fix. Let's go on social mm. media, or look, yeah. people like me, and so then it, it's a reinforcement loop that's going on. Mm. But at the same time, I think adults have got a lot of responsibility mm. here because we're constantly wedded to our phones. And even at dinner, people don't put their phones down. And I think it's absolutely shocking. We need to actually have a new relationship mm. with them because essentially it's another person sitting at the table, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, absolutely. I think you're right. I think it's not a bad thing inherently. It's connect people all over the world. It's a brilliant way of communicating. There's lots of benefits to the internet and social media, but we need to police our relationship with it in a better way. And I think absolutely parents, teachers, all of us need to set a better example. I don't like the way that a lot of people just sort of shrug and go, oh, well, it's too difficult to take phones away. It's so entrenched in our lives. It's a bit like saying that alcohol is deeply entrenched in our lives. Yes, but that doesn't mean you should let your kids have it from a very early age mm -hmm. and have absolutely no filters. This mm -hmm. is technology that there's no precedent for. You can't compare it to, say, the development of the printing press or something like that. And actually, the long-term effects on people's health and well-being and even how they interact with people, we don't actually know what the sure. long-term yeah. effects are. There are a is. lot of benefits to phones, though. Uh, in, mm. well, not in the same way that there's benefits to alcohol. It's communication and it's information, but actually how it is that you take that in. You know, mm. e equally, you know, people can become very sort of secluded and reclusive if they decide what they're going to do is read books all day. That doesn't necessarily... You know, if, you, if that's yes. all that you do is just you don't talk to anybody, you don't interact, it's not necessarily a healthy way of conducting yeah. your life. Uh, Rebecca, let's talk about the cost of living because the Beckhams are celebrating Easter on their yacht. They are, they are. <laughs> so there is no cost of they living crisis. Lives. No, no cozy lives for the Beckhams. Just um, a swimming cozy. No, and I, I, well, firstly, don't they all look great in their in their little bunny outfits? I'll hold it up. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, there they are. They're, they're, that's there aren't any bunny ears there. There are no bunny ears there. But, nice they're, they're, um, but, but I imagine this is the precursor to them celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary wow. oh. at Wembley. So they're booking out, hiring Wembley. I imagine they got some kind of deal on that. I mean, that's where they're what, going the to hold the stadium. The stadium, yeah. They um, have a lot of friends. A lot of lot. Well, uh, and <laughs> congratulations to them for keeping it going for 25 years. And um, so we all remember the iconic wedding, don't we, with the purple thrones? Of course. Yes. Sort of, it was all. Yeah. It was very gauche. So mm -hmm. I don't know if maybe there'll be a different aesthetic for this year. No, I hope. I hope, I hope they I bring hope that not. back. Yeah. yeah. Maybe the bunny ears. Oh, and I'm so, so that. the picture there is of the whole family the whole wearing family. pink bunny ears, yeah. looking resplendent and uh, very tall. And she had a boot on as well, didn't she? Because she, she's hurt her leg. So let's hope that's better for that she broke I think she fell off a treadmill didn't she as you yeah, do as you do um, so <laughs> I mean Benedict you, you? you've struggled with that haven't you oh many times I struggled to get on the treadmill that's the I always trip up and get on does this mean she's not going to be recreating the iconic picture of her having her leg up in the air with the boots oh my god well no, I think she absolutely see I do know well we're wishing her better aren't we because she's we, got a party we are together. we are yes. and uh, they look resplendent as I, I say in their bunny ears thank you very much to both <laughs> of you to Benedict you, and Rebecca they'll be back with more papers in <laughs> just under an hour. Yes, indeed. Well, young sisters from Dublin have brought their community together with their idea to collect and distribute Easter eggs to children in hospital. Now, Lauren and Ella May Metcalf have given over 800 Easter eggs to patients in various hospital wards across the city. Well, Thomas Metcalf is the proud father of the two girls and they join us now. Good morning and happy Easter to all of you. They Hello. all are. Morning. So, Thomas, can you tell us a little bit more about how they came up with the initiative? 
So back uh, about ten, uh, ten years ago, um, Lauren here broke her leg just before Easter, and on Easter Sunday when she woke up, she had about know, twenty odd Easter eggs, and she came to me and says, "Dad, can I bring some of these to the hospital?" And I was like, "Okay, yeah." I was really took back by it, so. Off we went into Temple Street Children's Hospital in Dublin with 19 Easter eggs. And ever since that, that's how it started. How, how lovely. And Lauren, um, just, just in terms of that, what, what, made you, what made you do this? It's such a lovely act of kindness. I think it was because I was in the hospital like so close to Easter. I'd known that there was other kids in there that wouldn't be able like to be at home for Easter. It was definitely like a thing to be like, oh my God, it's not fair on them to be stuck in hospital. Yeah. I mean, they're very scary places at the best of times. And I think just having that that um, sort of love and attention will, will do a, a great deal for people there. Did you see people's eyes light up? You do. Like when you, we have seen kids like walking by, going to appointments or coming out of appointments and we give them an egg, we just like give it to them on the way out. And then there was, a one girl and she sends a video of her daughter with an Easter egg and that like she's only with two or three and that literally I was crying watching oh, it. It was like and the lady said to me you know yeah and sent a picture of her daughter she was, and the joy in her face was amazing. What about the people who are donating these eggs to you? What about their stories and what does it mean to them to be able to help other people in this way? Yeah, well, we've, we've people from, like, the UK donate to us. We've people from Turkey. A friend of mine has a company in Turkey, gets slim in Turkey, and she donates to us every year uh, €100. Euros. Like, it goes a long way, you know? And we have a sister who lives in Warrington, and she donates, and a couple of her friends as well. And then the community of Bally One, where we live, is, like, it's amazing. It, the amount, of, the amount of donations we receive is... And, and just in terms of where you've come from, Lauren, you started with 20 eggs, it went up to 50 eggs, now 820 eggs. How many eggs are we aiming for? Definitely a thousand. That's a thousand? Like Fantastic. And That's LMA, yeah. LMA, what do you like? You obviously like Easter eggs, do you, LMA? <laughs> What's your favourite <laughs> Easter egg, LMA? What What did you eat yesterday for Easter? What's your favourite Easter egg? Mini egg. Mini egg. Very good choice. Oh, Super choice. Fantastic choice. Well, thank you so much uh, there to Thomas, Lauren and LMA. What a wonderful family. And keep <laughs> up the good work. Thank yeah, you happy for all Easter you do. To, to you all. Well, you've been getting in touch with your views and opinions all morning. Uh, we've been talking about the fact that the Prime Minister is under pressure to call a general election, even more so than he was last week. We, we are. Ian says the Conservative Party has long stopped being Conservative. This actually uh, sort of actually speaks to what Lord Frost is saying, saying that actually we as a Conservative Party need to stop being Conservative. He goes on to say, I haven't made up my mind yet as I'm waiting for the manifestos, which is a brilliant point, but the Tories have indeed lost my vote. We're also talking about the Labour Party. There is a row brewing about them ditching the union flag from their literature because some inner city MPs say it's putting people off voting Labour. Well, uh, Carol texted us to her view via uh, the way she texted talk and, and her message to 8722. She said the union flag is our country's flag. Anyone who isn't proud of it must be in the wrong country. France arrests people for insulting their flag. Americans would never ever put up with it. Labour is going to ship our country down the river and the sheep will vote with them and bleat when Britain is gone. We are doomed. It's quite poetic from Carol there. It's very good, actually. Uh, Pablo says, it's a very sad state of affairs when a party is against advertising the flag of the country they're wanting to govern. Mm. In fact, it's quite worrying. And Tobias says, rather than seeing uh, my flag axed, I would like to see the Labour Party thrown out altogether. It's a shame our politicians have sunk this low and there is zero outrage. How did 
we get here. Well, I wouldn't say there's zero outrage. We've got certainly a lot, <laughs> there's of a lot of outrage, outrage on actually. the text this morning. Right. Well, still to come on the show, Sam Allard is here and he has your sport. Yeah, yesterday saw Premier League champions play out a 10 straw with rivals Arsenal at home uh, with the, uh, the defending for the lives Arsenal to try and stay in that title race. But the real winners of the draw have to be Liverpool. They now go top of the table after beating Brighton and in women's football in the Conti Cup, Arsenal. They won the League Cup, beating Chelsea 1-0, but there was some bad blood between the managers. Find out why. That's next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to abandon and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to your talk today. It is 10 to 8. Now, yesterday was anticlimactic for football fans after Man City and Arsenal ended what was billed as a clash of the ages at nil all. Yeah, here with more on that is Talk Sports Sam Ellard. Sam, it's the bit I look forward to every <laughs> single morning yes, as you same. know. No, My favourite part of the show as well. well. I know it. No, no. And a very robust introduction, may I just say, before what do you the mean break. Robust? Oh, it was it was excellent. Um let, let's Thank move you. <laughs> High praise. Let, let's move on. Arsenal keep Manchester City at bay as uh, title rivals play out. And as we said there with a, a nil all draw. Yeah, so um obviously a massive game. Um so much hype, so much anticipation going into this game. Before the weekend, um, Liverpool and Arsenal were on the same point. City won behind. Um, this was an incredibly dull game of football. It finished 0-0. <laughs> um, what was quite bizarre was that Arsenal, who have so many great attacking players, normally play so you know a lot of good attacking football, were really, really defensive. Clearly, their game plan 
was was pretty obvious. They wanted to be very defensive, kind of in a way park the boss and play on the counter-attack. And right. they executed that game plan really, really well. In fact, they had two really good chances on the counter-attack. What was quite strange is that Manchester City, who we know have got some of the best players in the world, I, for me, really, really lacked a little bit of quality in that final third. And yeah, for a game that had so much hype and, and anticipation around it, I've got to be honest with you, I'd love to sit here and say it was a, 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 a thrilling nil-nil, an intense tactical battle. It was quite dull, a little bit boring. Um, so that finished nil-nil. So Arsenal remain one point clear in Manchester City. And I definitely think that it's, it's Arsenal who go back to London, the happier of the two sides. Right. What about Liverpool and Brighton? Was that dull? Not dull at all. I think Liverpool and Brighton could play 100 times a week. And really? that would never be a dull game of football because two teams want to press her up the pitch and win the ball back and, and, and play attacking football. Um, Brighton took an early lead. Liverpool ended up coming back to win 2-1. So they went back to the top of the Premier League. And then, of course, who were the real winners of yesterday? Definitely Liverpool because then their two title rivals end up drawing as well. So Liverpool gained two points right. on both Man City and both Arsenal. So Liverpool top. They're now two points clear of Arsenal and they're now two points, three points clear, sorry, I should say, of Manchester City. So a great day for Liverpool. They won their game. Man City and Arsenal draw. Yeah. And of course, Jurgen Klopp's final season at Liverpool. Is it just fate? Is it just right <laughs> that Jurgen Klopp's going to bow out at Anfield with the Premier League in front of fans? Maybe, just maybe. They're doing so well. They want to see they got Salah back to his best. Van Dijk's playing really, really well. And even when, and also the key thing with Liverpool as well here, guys, is they've got a lot of big players still to come back in the next week or so. The title race. I know you're excited, but I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. Going right down well, to the I was going to say, who was the star of that show? Who was the man of the match for that? For Liverpool? For, no, for the Brighton match. I'm just interested. Um, oh, good question. Man of Thank match. you. Are you throwing him under the bus? I am. I'm I'm totally totally under the bus. No, the there's bus. so many options. My man of the match. Oh, look, I think Alexis McAllister of Liverpool was, yep. was fantastic. So much of what, so much good stuff that Liverpool do. Comes to him in comes to him in midfield. I think he's been an unbelievable signing for us. How many games have they got left? We got nine <laughs> games left in the Premier League. Nine games this, left. Put Sam on the spot. No, no, throw me anything, guys. I'm ready for this. Right. Anything for should should we talk on. about Chelsea women's manager yeah. slamming male aggression? What's that about? Um, yes, the Arsenal boss Jonas Idevel said it was irresponsible of the Chelsea manager Emma Hayes to refer. Um, to him and his behaviour yesterday as male aggression. It was an altercation between the two managers after the League Cup final. Um, Arsenal won 1-0 and Hayes pushed Idaval away at the end of the game. Or, I mean, kind of leant into him right. and pushed him. And Idaval said he did not feel comfortable with that label. What happened here, guys, is the Swede had an altercation with a Chelsea midfielder, Aaron Cuthbert, during the game, which he said um, kind of came about because the team disagreed about whether there should be a multiple system in play. They said no. And then towards the end of the game, he felt as if a Chelsea player were trying to use more than one ball. Emma Hayes then said that was male aggression. Now, for me, my opinion, I yeah. think it's absolutely bang out of order to use that phrase to Jonas Eideval because he had a disagreement with yeah. a player on the, on the side of the pitch. These things happen all the time. This was a cup final but yesterday, this by hot the way. headed words, do you think? Or, yeah, or no, I, yeah. listen, I, I think Emma Hayes should not have used that. And I think this morning, I think she'll regret saying it. Because I don't think mm. using, it, using him as a man is, is relevant. No, it, it does relevant. exist within the sport generally and it exists within women's sport as well and i can understand from her perspective she probably has had to deal with a lot of male aggression in you know her sure. career but was it necessarily in this moment absolutely not he had a disagreement with the player and also i don't think this should be because the, the kind of clip as well of after the game of emma kind of shoving the the right. after, has kind of gone viral and stuff and that's not a great look because it's emma hayes mm. final few months at chelsea they got such a good chance of winning loads of competitions i hope this doesn't run and run and run i'm sure it won't i hope the next time she speaks she kind of says you know what yeah. hate at the moment should use that phrase and if that happens let's all move on yeah, yeah i think that's right absolutely right let's talk about the fabio wardley and fraser clark fight oh i'll tell you what <laughs> great i've never fight. heard of them in my life no well i'll tell you no, what you should you weren't you watching Watching what? <laughs> we should have listened to talk spot while watching the fight exactly. on the television. Um, a great did, fight, Fabio, exactly oh, boxing, right? Fabio yeah. Wardley and it's Fraser boxing. Clark contested a, a thrilling um, split decision draw. Um, it, one judge had it 114 to 113, the other 115 to 112. Then the third one had it 113, 113. They both retain their unbeaten records. 
The good thing from this, look, we didn't want to draw, but the good thing is we're going to get a rematch. These right. are two absolute beasts in the ring. It was an unbelievable fight. We want to see we, we, we want to see it again. It has to happen again. And the fact that it was a draw means what? we are going to get you it again. You can't have a draw in a fight. Why can't you Why have not? a draw in a fight? Well, someone's got to... No. What about football? What about cricket? There's yeah, a draws in all sports. Yeah, that's a fight. That's just a game. Why can't you have a draw? What, 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 so, so, sorry. <laughs> that's that's completely be, blown your mind. There has to be somebody who walks yeah. away the loser in a fight. So what happens if, if me and you, not that it would ever happen, have yeah, a fight? I'd win. Yeah, I'm sure you would. I would absolutely win. <laughs> who'd no who'd win? You or Rosie Wright in a boxing fight? Oh, do you know what? She's wow. a little bit shorter than me. Uh, you got the height. You got the reach. I've got the height yeah. advantage. I, I wouldn't no take either on. No actually, no those two. Every talk TV presenter being you in a boxing ring, right? I don't yeah. fancy your chance. Listen, against I anyone. used to box at school, so just be careful. Be careful it's what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Right, we'll break this up. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you so much, Sam. Still to come. Now the Conservatives face electoral wipeout. That is according to a new mega poll. We'll be discussing that next. This is Talk Today. It is seven fifty-six. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Nicola Thorpe. A very good morning to you. It is 8 o'clock on Monday, the 1st of April. Well, you'll be talk today on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Here are your top stories this morning. Electoral wipeout. The Conservative Party faces its worst defeat in history. Now, that's according to a new mega poll with the Prime Minister's own seat at risk. Killer delays. More than 250 patients are dying every week due to long waits for A&E care. 
And time to rebudget. The energy price cap falls today, but other expenses are going up. We'll speak to experts to explain what that means for your money. And low pressure is going to dominate our weather throughout the week, bringing showers and some longer spells of rain. But it's not all bad news. The weather details coming up very shortly. Cheers, Joe. Now it's time for your headlines with Katie. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. Hundreds of patients have died unnecessarily each week in England due to any waits. That's the finding of a shocking new study from the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. It found there was likely to be an excess death for every 72 patients who spent 8 to 12 hours in the emergency department. And the longer the wait, the greater risk of death. Bobby Coban from the Telegraph told Talk today it's just another sign the system is in crisis absolutely the opposite of what you want to be hearing. You want to be thinking, when you're in the A&E ward, you're going to be safer. But a friend of mine had to go to A&E recently and said it was just unbelievable. The, the, just There's not enough staff around. There are people sitting out in the corridor, the waits are over 12 hours, if you're lucky. I think it probably shows that we cannot just wait until the election to put off the crisis in the NHS. Households already struggling in the cost of living crisis are facing even more pressure. From today, seven major household bills are going up. Regular bills like council tax and water will rise, so will broadband and mobile phone costs. The good news is the new energy cap, the price cap, it comes into effect. That means from today, energy bills will fall. But there's some good news for millions of lower paid workers. The government's increased the minimum wage by more than a pound for the very first time. The national living wage is rising from £10.42 an hour to £11.44. It's a pay rise of £1,800 a year. Scotland's new hate crime laws have come into force. New offences have been introduced for stirring up hatred based on prejudice towards protected characteristics. Well, they include age, disability, religion, sexual orientation and gender. And the X Factor star Lucy Spragan has announced Simon Cow will walk her down the aisle when she marries Amelia Smith in June. Spragan left the show in 2012 under difficult circumstances and she became friends with the judge years later. She told the son she asked him if he'd give her away before they went swimming in the sea together. He said it would be an honour. I'll be back at nine o'clock with more headlines for you. Super, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Katie. Katie. Now let's move on to our top story today. The Conservative Party could be left with fewer than 100 MPs. That's according to new bombshell polling. While well, predicting the worst Tory defeat in history, more than a dozen ministers and even the Prime Minister himself could lose their seats. Well, we're joined now by Talk TV's political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald. Good morning, Alicia. Thank you for joining us. Now, what is the mood among Conservative MPs when you speak to them privately about this kind of polling? I mean, it's really quite a dire and bleak mood in Westminster at the moment and has been for quite some time because this isn't the first poll that has suggested something like this. I mean, it's the first time we've heard them clinging on to maybe less than 100 seats, but it's definitely not the first really bad poll that we've had for the Conservative Party. So the mood is generally quite bad. But there are still some really quite hopeful Conservative MPs amongst them who still think that there is a chance that the wipeout might, may not be as bad as some of these polls are predicting. Lots of them saying that this is just actually more just damage control and that they actually might pull through a bit more in the end. I mean, in some ways, Alicia, you and I have spoken about the polls so many times. This comes on the back of that YouGov poll, which there was some better news for the Conservatives going up some two points. We had John Curtis saying there's a 99% chance of Labour forming the next government as well. In some ways, could this help the Conservatives? Because people looking at this thinking, well, I don't want a Labour government. Does it maybe change the way that they might vote? I mean, in a way, but also lots of people are even saying that actually losing this election might not be the worst thing for the Conservative Party either. You know, they've been in power for quite some time now. And whilst you're in power, it doesn't give you a whole lot of time to kind of regroup and recalibrate and kind of formulate your ideas um, for the future. So lots of people are saying that actually this could somehow work in their favour in the long term. Obviously, that's slightly clutchy at straws because at the end of the day, losing an election is not a good thing for any party uh, on face value. But that's definitely a theory that lots of them are clinging on to. The other really interesting thing about this poll, I think, is the, 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 the types of people who might be losing their seat. I mean, even the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, we talk a lot about who could replace him as the next um, potential leader of the Conservative Party. But I think we forget how much it actually really banks on who's actually left and who's viable as an option after the election crops up and lots of them might potentially lose those seats. And Alicia, 
polls like this, will they have any sway whatsoever in Rishi Sunak's decision on when to hold that general election? Or do you see it still happening at the end of the year? Well, we're actually hearing that lots of Conservative MPs are now actually trying to pressure Rishi Sunak into holding an election as well, because for some time now it's just been Labour and it's been opposition parties who have been really desperate for, for that early election. Um, but we've actually been hearing over the weekend that now there's lots of members of the actual government and of the Conservative Party who are just saying that maybe it's time and that actually the country have pretty much stop listening to any of their ideas just because everyone seems a bit checked out and they want something a bit fresh and new and they want something to happen pretty soon. So, so talking of not listening, insiders are saying that Downing Street is a complete mess, the Prime Minister himself is hangry, he's been fasting, he's angry, he doesn't respond, he snaps at people. So just in terms of what he is going to do, given the local election results, if they are really bad for the Conservative Party, what does Rishi Sunak do then? Does he then say, well, we're going to wait and see if there's going to be some better news, or does he press that nuclear button and go to the country? See, well, I think most people would say that if it's bad, you should probably just call it there and then because it doesn't really seem like it's going to get much better if it's, if it's bad at this point. But I think from his and the government's logic, it will be the opposite. I think they'll say, OK, we can't call an election in the wake of this bad result from the locals. Let's wait. Let's see if we can build on that. Let's see if we can improve and push it to a bit later down the line in the year. I think probably much to the public's frustration. I think lots of the public definitely feel like they have just really had enough and they just want an election sooner rather than later so they can actually have their say in what happens. But I definitely think that will be the logic that is used by Rishi Sunak. Mm -hmm. And Alicia, how do you think that this story on the front page of the Mail and the Times will play out for Sunak's government? Uh, over 250 patients a week may have died for no reason due to extremely long waiting times in A&E departments. It's not going to play very well with the electorate, I imagine. It's definitely not. And I mean, the NHS is always a really, really key thing in general elections. But I think this begs the wider question of why it's just seen as so important during general elections. I mean, the NHS was something that the UK kind of held up as something to be really, really proud of. And now we even have lots of really senior MPs coming forward and saying that it definitely isn't something to be proud of and that it needs serious work and improvement. So I think there'll be a lot of pressure on whoever enters government to sort this out. But actually before then as well, I mean, this is a really, really urgent issue. And I think when people's lives are at stake, it definitely does chime with the public a lot. Lots, lots of members of the public saying they just want to be able to get a GP appointment. They just want to be able to go to A&E. These are mm -hmm. things that do really, really matter to people. Can, can I just ask you finally, just in terms of votes of no confidence, you, you, they need to get 53 in uh, to the chairman of the 1922 to depose sooner. Is there any sense from you and the conversations you've had as to the number of people who may or may not have submitted a vote of no confidence in the Prime Minister? God, I wish I had that golden number. That would be really useful. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the thing is, is you ask anyone at the moment and they, they all pretty much deny it. I mean, no one wants to come forward and say that they have submitted a vote of no confidence in their own Prime Minister, especially when he is a consecutive leader of the same party that we've had in such a short space of time. Um, lots of which have been replaced through that exact means. So lots of people really, really not keen to come forward and say. I mean, I definitely don't think the number is approaching the threshold yet, um, but there's definitely a sizable amount of MPs who definitely have done that. Well, Sorry, I can't be more precise. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd know better, Alicia, honestly. <laughs> Go and find out. That's your task for the rest of Bank Holiday Monday. Thank you so much, Alicia Fitzgerald, for joining us this morning. Yeah. Well, let's take a look through some of your thoughts and comments this morning. Um, the Prime Minister is under pressure to call a general election. Have you already made up your mind on who you are voting for? Yeah, Jason says it looks like Britain might undergo a repeat of what happened to Canada in the 1990s. Two Conservative parties, he's talking here about uh, the Tories and the Reformers, even the names are the same, which is very true, actually. It really? would achieve nothing other than splitting the vote and making the outcome a foregone conclusion. Aaron says, I don't think everyone has decided which party they're voting for. They've just decided not to vote for the Conservatives. Quite well. Ed says, I'm moving away from a two-party system. I want to vote for a genuine or perhaps a suitable independent candidate who looks after us locally. Yeah, I wonder what your thoughts are also on the Labour Party ditching the union flag on their campaign literature. There's been a fuss made by some of the inner city MPs saying we don't want the union flag on our campaign literature because it puts off people from certain ethnic minority 
groups. What are your thoughts on that? Email us, talktoday at talk.tv. You can tweet us at talktv. You can also text us, text the word talk in your message to 87. Too. Well, let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages now. The Mail leads on those new figures showing hundreds of needless deaths occurred on a weekly basis last year in England due to agonising wait times on A&E wards. In the Telegraph, we're told that three quarters of England's second homeowners are set to be charged double council tax next year. That is a move affecting 130,000 properties. And finally, the Sun says, return of the king, as Charles is photographed waving at well-wishers outside St George's Chapel this Easter weekend. Now, Labour is accusing the government of having a childcare pledge without a plan, after Ofsted analysis suggested the number of childcare places fell by a 1,000 last year. Well, this comes as new data from money-saving app Plum shows that almost 40% of parents are spending over £200 a week on childcare up from just under 30% last year. Well, we can actually speak to Plum's head of money, Rajan Lakhani. A very good morning to you. Just, just in terms of this childcare, on the, on the basis, on the top of this, it looks like good news. You get more childcare a week, uh, which is now available, 15 hours of free childcare a week. That seems like good news. What concerns, though, do parents have? But it is a welcome development, this extra 15 hours uh, for two-year-olds a week starting uh, from this week. And then that'll be expanded further in September to nine-month-olds and then between nine-month-olds to um, under five-year-olds uh, by September uh, next year. So it is a welcome development, but there are challenges in terms of the deliverability of these uh, childcare changes. A number of providers have experienced issues in terms of the shortfall of our finances they have to deliver this. Now, the government have, to their credit, taken some steps to address this. Uh, the Chancellor recently announced guaranteed rates, which will rise, um, which will be indexed linked to make sure that childcare providers have enough finance to um, pay staff. And that's one of the big costs that have increased. Childcare providers aren't immune from inflation. They've had the same issues that we've all faced, whether it's with the energy bills, rental costs, or staffing costs today. And I noted you know, in your headlines, you mentioned the, the, the minimum wage uh, rising as well. And that's another cost that childcare providers are, are having to pay. So all these costs are rising, but there's a big shortfall. And now the government are taking steps to help address it, but they're still facing a significant shortfall. And that's challenging the deliverability. And as you highlighted, earlier as well. There's a big supply and demand issue as a number of providers have either had to reduce what they can provide or can't provide any support at all and had to close down. Absolutely, Rajan. And just from my personal experience, I've, I've just had a little girl, she's three months old, and already I'm being told to try and register her at a nursery. And a couple of the nurseries that we've spoken to have said, we, just, we simply don't have the staff. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a, a really big challenge. And it's really hard for parents. You know, some research we did at Plum found that 68% of parents find the whole childcare process confusing because you've got free childcare hours, you've got tax-free childcare, you've got childcare benefits and other support that's available and it's a minefield. And then on top of that, you have to um, potentially face these challenges around uh, not only where to find the support, but also whether that support is available from your local providers. So it's really, really challenging for parents. And when you add to the fact that parents are facing rising costs at the moment, whether it is with childcare or other costs, 1.6 million households are going to be remortgaging this year and they've had cost of living challenges as well. So it's a real challenge for parents. And this, this is borne out in this poll that you've done, isn't it, in terms of uh, the numbers of parents who say that they're struggling so much they're actually cutting back on what they're spending on food, for example. Absolutely. But yeah, there's a significant proportion um, that have uh, cut down on food and parents are having to make a lot of really difficult choices, you know, not only cutting food, but actually whether they work um, as well. Uh, approximately 70% of those uh, parents in our research uh, said that they're having to make a decision about whether to reduce their working hours. And with the British economy, two of the fundamental issues at the moment are the change in the employee base following uh, the pandemic and also productivity. And if people are having to reduce their hours because of childcare, that means there's less workers um, available and that damages the productivity and also forces employers potentially to raise, wide, to raise wages. And that, of course, um, has impact on inflation as well. So, Rajan, Labour is saying that the Tories have got childcare pledges without a plan. Have they shone any light on what their plan would be for childcare? Well, I, I, it, I, you know, Labour have talked about um, how they want to support childcare. 
and, and have put forward a number of initiatives. I think they have questioned the deliverability of what uh, the Conservatives have produced, but I think there is, without a doubt, whoever is in government um, after the next election, childcare is going to be a very important focus. And I think you know, Labour will probably reveal more details when it comes to when their manifesto um, is, is published. But you know, that's, I think, a really important development for parents is that over the last two years, childcare is now one of the big political issues. Oh. And that's a really promising um, development. And, and of course, that feeds into a much bigger political argument about how we make sure this country grows and prospers. And of course, we need to look after children, as you rightly say, to get people back into work so we don't have to rely on imported labour. Yeah, there is that broader impact on um, immigration as well. And you know, there has been a you know, big rise in immigration because there are essential jobs within the UK that there aren't employees available to fill those and, and that's led to that increase in immigration. So over the longer term, there are some questions around, you know, what we do want the UK to look, you know, in terms of its policy, what is, what is it around immigration, what is it in terms of employment? These are, you know, massive questions and they're all connected with childcare, which is, I think, a really um, key way of why it's become such an important political issue. And as I said, whoever's in, in government, um, it's going to be a critical issue for them to address. And I think the fundamental thing is to make sure that childcare providers do have the finance and support they have need to deliver on these changes. They're ambitious changes, they're important changes, but they need to have that deliverability um, to, to, to do that. And, and, and that's really important. And also making sure that parents have all the information they need to, to make the right choices for their children. Speaking of Rajan, where can young parents go to get information on what is available for them at the moment, asking for a friend? <laughs> so the government's official website is, uh, is actually quite helpful. So there is a really good summary of all the different types of support that are available. So you can get free childcare hours, um, which is what's being extended today. You've got tax-free uh, childcare um, as well, and, and as well as a child benefit. And that's something that the government did change. So before, there was a cut-off um, from 50,000 onwards where the child benefit would be tapered. And then if you earn 60,000 pounds or more, you wouldn't receive child benefit. Now that's been changed. The, um, the Chancellor said that actually you can receive child benefit if you earn up to 60,000, and then that taper begins from 60,000 to 80,000, where that child benefit um, is, is reduced. So there's some additional support available. So it's really important parents take advantage of that. I will have a look later. Thank you so much, <laughs> uh, Rajan Nakani, there. Thank you for joining us this morning. Well, still to come on Talk Today, half a million antidepressant prescriptions in the past year were handed to children. Plus, why new love is motivating. Wow. Rebecca Hudson from the News Movement and Conservative commentator Benedict Spencer here to look through this morning's papers. Do stay with us. The time is 8.17. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, was a trans 
sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 8.21. Now we'll have the weather in just a moment. But here's what else is coming up in the programme. With the energy price cap set to fall by 12% today, we're asking what that means for your bills. Plus, some Labour MPs are calling the Union Jack detrimental and alienating. The Sun's Rod Little is here with all the details at nine. And would you want to live forever? Well, yes. new AI technology is offering the chance to be immortalised as a digital avatar. Oh. That's at 10 past nine. Well, let's take a look at the weather now with Joe. Please tell me it's going to be sunshine when I leave the studio later. Do you know, it was nice and bright in the <laughs> south this morning. Uh, um, so, no. Won't uh, last. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, it's, it's all looking very unsettled over the next few days. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, the jet stream is still a long, long way south, and that's allowing these low-pressure systems to move in on us. And certainly the current one is bringing very unsettled weather, not just for us, but also for much of the near continent as well. So if you're off on holiday this week, uh, won't it be until the middle of the week that things start to settle a little there? And for us, we're going to keep the low pressures going to the end of the week. And then there's a spell of very wet, very windy weather as we go towards the weekend. So this is the way things look for today. Three areas of weather. The best of the sunshine, most likely northwestern parts of Scotland. It has brightened up down in the south, but we'll also find as temperatures rise that we'll see showers developing as well, and some of these could be heavy, could be thundery. And it's through these central areas that things are really very gloomy indeed. A lot of low cloud, misty, murky conditions. We've got an easterly flow, which is bringing the cloud off the North Sea onto those uh, areas of parts of Scotland, Northern Ireland, Northern England as well. And some of the rain contained in that is heavy. So if you're travelling, Really not very pleasant conditions at all. A lot of surface water and spray. And that through the course of the day, well, we see that rain area edging its way northwards. It is making very slow progress. Elsewhere, the showers tend to die away, but they will keep going along the south coast. And once again, some of these could be on the heavy side. But things are a little bit milder than they have been. And so for much of the country, we will avoid a frost overnight away from the far northwest, where temperatures may just drop that little extra bit. And then through the course of Tuesday, well, it's Scotland that sees this rather grey, dismal weather with further rain to come. Elsewhere, should start quite nicely. Showers bubbling up as time goes on. And once again, some of these could be fairly heavy. But if you manage to get out of the rain and uh, fairly sheltered, temperatures up to around 14 or 15 degrees Celsius will feel quite uh, pleasant indeed. That's 59 degrees Fahrenheit. However, later on in the day, we start to see this area of cloud working its way in towards the southwest. That will push its way northwards and some of that rain will turn heavy at times. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thanks, Joe. Conservative commentator Benedict Spence and the news movement's Rebecca Hudson are here with us for a look through this morning's papers. Let's start with you, Rebecca, this time, if we can. Front page of The Guardian. Plan to scrap non-DOM tax status is mm. full of loopholes for the super-rich. Mm. It's a complicated mm. story, this one, and The Guardian believes it's unearthed some details here, particularly the pertinent to the Prime Minister and his wife. Isn't it just... And you're right, also kind of have to couch that this is sort of Labour analysis of the talk 
Tory plans. So we are just issuing the caveat at the top. But you're right. So um, in the in the most recent budget, um, the, the Tories kind of stole Labour, one of Lab Labour's big <laughs> flagship policies that they're going to start, that they're going to scrap the, the tax benefits that you get as a non-DOM status, which obviously Labour were going to use to pay for all manner of things. Now they've only got the that on private times. schools <laughs> to pay for things. Um, but on, a bit of analysis shows that there are actually still lots and lots and lots of loopholes. So if you've got um, a lot of expo expo disposable income, which I think lots of people do, and you've got some um, wealthy accountants or smart accountants, there are lots of tax loopholes that mean that you can still um, save a huge amount of money and benefit from that non-DOM status, including, as you say, the Prime Minister's own family, who could still save up to 250 million quid from their mega fortune under these rules. So it's kind of non-DOM, but not really. non dom dom yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's is, it. This is red meat, isn't it, Benedict, <laughs> yeah. to, to Labour voters, talking about non-DOM tax. But actually, I'm not sure how, and maybe you know more than I do, just in terms of how important it is for, for the economy and the fiscal state of this nation. I mean, there is a line of thought that the Labour Party perhaps isn't talking about very much because it doesn't play very well with their voters, which is that what the Tories are doing is right now they're addressing the issues of uh, non-DOM status and they're making it therefore more difficult for the Labour Party to use it to raise money because some, you know, in some in some cases, non-domiciled individuals do contribute a lot of money to the UK mm. economy. In other cases, they don't. Uh, but the, the way that the Tories have done this, it's very deliberately set up as a sort of a trap for the Labour Party. When they come in, it's actually going to harm them in terms of making money uh, from this. But as Becca says, this is a fantastic opportunity for tax lawyers everywhere. <laughs> and one of the major issues with the UK's tax system is it is far too complicated. We never attempt to simplify it in this country no. because yeah. the more complexities you add to it, the more loopholes you actually create. And it really is, it's got to a stage where I think a sensible government would take a real slash and burn approach to tax in this country, which is to just make it a lot more simple for everybody to understand. And the more you simplify it, the harder it therefore gets for incredibly clever tax lawyers to find ways around paying for things. Makes but sense. of course we're not going to do that because that does make sense. It? <laughs> you sound like Ed Vasey. He's always <laughs> yes. talking about a tax simplification. Yeah. It makes sense to me. Mm. Um, right, we're going to move on now, Benedict, to page 12 of the Mail. Incredible story. There's been a rise in, in prescription antidepressants for children. Yeah, this is up 44% since 2015. Almost half a million people. I thought it was under the age of 16. It's only under the age of 18. But still, that's a huge number of people are being prescribed antidepressants, including, uh, the Mail says, uh, more than 4,000 under the age of 10 given antidepressants. And I think, oh, wow. you know, we can sort of sit here and talk at great length about the mental health crises that a lot of people are facing. But the thing is, antidepressants can be incredibly powerful drugs, actually, and they have a lot of side effects that are not entirely or are always understood. They were not necessarily developed with children in mind. If you are on them for any length of time, you can become dependent, and there are also links to psychosis. To put children on these things at a time when, you know, their bodies, their brains are going through a period of change, uh, without incredibly cautious oversight and sort of forensic surveillance and monitoring yeah. of them, I think is incredibly concerning. And you know, we can weigh up on the one hand saying children are very anxious, they're very upset, they're under a lot of stress. We can talk about the impacts of social media and smartphones on that. On the other side, you do have to say, what are the long-term impacts going to be? And is the, is the medicine, if you like, perhaps going to have some really nasty kicks down the line uh, in, in terms of actually stymieing this in the short term. I mean, this basically is bad medicine. There is no way kids should be on antidepressants unless it is absolutely necessary. And I do wonder how much this plays into what we spoke about earlier, as Benedict alludes to, about social media as well, and children feeling vulnerable and lonely and all the rest of it. But actually, that's part and parcel of growing up too. Mm. And they need to be loved and have support networks and all the rest of it. And really, drugs are the last resort. Yeah, it absolutely should be. And I think addressing those environmental factors, social media, the fact that it's, we are this sort of more disconnected than we've ever been. Lots of these kids will have been, you know, very, very young during the pandemic, which was, you know, during very formative years for them. And obviously, and definitely kind of medicalising the res uh, antidepressants is the, is the last resort. But I think it's because there's also a lack of support and a lack of training and a lack of other resources for kids to go to. And so it, the, kind of the only thing we can do is prescribe antidepressants because we don't have access to, you know, a really robust mental health it's, service in this country. It's, it's tricky that we take a sort of a one-size-fits-all approach, you know, you've got a problem, here's a pill for it. Yeah. yeah. Mm. The, the problem, very American. I mean, I'm just, mm. just off the bat, boys and girls, when they're developing, are very different and have very different needs. It's why, actually, their mental health crises manifest themselves in very different ways. Mm. Uh, girls are a lot more complicated. But, actually, in a lot of cases... <laughs> just what generally. Do you, no, what do you mean? Seriously, no. In a lot of cases, when it comes to boys, when it comes to diagnoses around things like ADHD and sort of hyperactivity and depression, yeah. actually, what they lack 
is exercise and structure because they get a lot less of that in the schools than they used to. Boys at that age are quite simple. Not all, of course. Mm -hmm. There yes. are always going to be exceptions. But for a lot of these boys, especially, I suspect, yeah, and we've seen this a lot with, as you mentioned, in the United States, the epidemic of people being given ADHD medication when actually they're just, you know, they're reaching an age where they're being asked to sit in classrooms for sort of eight hours a day. And you're, and and you're they right, you're running, absolutely right on ADHD. Food, but but like that. one of the triads of symptoms is hyperactivity, and you're mm. right, actually, boys are hyperactive generally. And Unless you get them out there and you actually make sure, sure they exercise, yeah. and that they mm. all, they need to they need to be exercised to, mm. to make sure that they grow Do you think and prosper. We're guilty of uh, over pathologizing yes. what, what should be very very normal human yes. emotions. Hundred yeah. percent. Mm. And and I, and I suppose in in this case, probably a lack of time yeah. for GPs as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, it's a, a kind. Of, it's an awful thing to say, but a, a so-called quick fix yeah. is, is to give children medication, Absolutely. whereas actually they should be having long-term long therapy, long-term therapy, or... all kinds of other things. But yeah, what do you do if you're faced with a, with a child okay. presenting with those symptoms? It's the easiest, quickest thing to do. I Absolutely. was prescribed antidepressants when I was, uh, I wasn't a child child, but I was about 17. But it's because mm. I was also on the contraceptive pill, which was oh, yeah. full of hormones because I had bad periods. Mm. Mm. And it's the knock-on effect of all these different types of medication. You end up, you know, yeah. it's, it's, just, it's a tricky one. But mm. then, you know, there's going to be so many desperate parents out there struggling with children who might be, you know, having suicidal ideations, et cetera, mm -hmm. and doing anything that they can to try and help. In which case, it would be a very different matter. Yeah. So, so you do need to intervene, actually. Yeah. Good, yeah. good. Right, we're going to move on now. Uh, King Charles is all smiles and waves at the Royal uh, Easter get-together yesterday. Well, we're happy to see that uh, the King is obviously feeling well enough to appear in public. Mm. Um, you know, he mm. does... It uh, looks, looks uh, OK there. I mean, you know, given the severity of... Well, <laughs> the illness of cancer is an incredibly serious condition. Um, and given his age, you know, any sort of... Uh, uh, a sprightly movement at this point in time, I think, is to be welcomed. Um, and, of course, this all comes off the back of the furore around uh, the Princess of Wales um, and, uh, you know, the, the rumours and stories, and then, obviously, the revelations about her health situation. I think it's... It must be said, actually, whatever you think of King Charles, I think he... Him being very upfront about his diagnosis and telling people this is something that you need to take seriously, again, men often don't go to the mm. doctor about these things or leave them until it's too late. I think it's a very good thing and then also be putting on a brave face for the rest of the family, taking the heat off the Princess of Wales. Uh, that's already happened, obviously, but, you know, going out mm. in public and meeting people, it's a welcome thing to see because I think actually everybody increasingly knows somebody who has got cancer or who has been ill and it's a really sort of an awful situation to have to face. It, it mm. is absolutely, and of course what we've seen is it's driven men to go and get checked out for prostate mm. cancer, for which example, mm. which is fantastic. Rebecca, is there an issue here? Uh, and I mentioned it earlier, the King wanted a slim down monarchy and of course actually now that's a major problem mm. because when you look at the numbers of working royals, they're very low and the Duke of Kent is 80 88. Princess Alexandra of Kent is 87. <laughs> the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester, well, they're spring chickens. They're just 79 and 77. So you, you haven't got any working royals. No, and also, you know, the idea of the monarchy, you know, I think the, the vision was that it was going to be this kind of young, vital, modern institution with Kate and William. And now, like you say, you know, you've got kind of, you know, slightly at the sort of older scale of now these... Oh, they're definitely old. Yeah. Very yeah. old. Yeah. Um, you know, out and about kind of representing this institution. I mean, it's, it really hasn't worked out very well. And the Queen, I mean, she has picked up so much work, hasn't she? I mean, what a phenomenal... And we all kind of know, you know, Camilla, I think, is not renowned for her kind of work ethic, is it? I think she kind of... she li I think she kind of famously likes to sort of, you know, take things easy, and she absolutely <laughs> hasn't. She's embraced this role, um, you know, with incredible gusto. And, and him yesterday kind of out and about reassuring people and an incredible symbol to people who have who are, who've ca who have cancer or have family members with cancer that, you know, that, that life goes on, I think, yeah. is, is, is I found it powerful. fascinating he's shaking people's hands, actually, because yeah. Yeah. there was a lot of talk, wasn't there, actually, that he wouldn't be doing that because of the treatment mm. that he's under and so on. So, actually, mm. in some ways, that's a very positive thing yeah, that he so. feels he can do that. Is yeah. it down to him for having slimmed down the monarchy, though? Or did we just lose some key members? We did. Through, <laughs> I think we were know. a bit careless, weren't we? And we lost two quite, We lost two pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. Um, we lost three. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 I, mean, I suppose Andrew wasn't our fault. No, I think mean, he lost himself. We slightly lost <laughs> the others. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think, you know, the plan, I think the plan would have made sense. A young young families, cool young people going out and kind of modernising this institution was great and then it's obviously sort of slightly back. Because Beatrice and Eugenie, they were never going to be no. working royals. No. So it was, it's just Harry, Meghan and... And, and, Kay, and, and they would well, yeah. And Andrew's still yeah. at the... At the Easter ceremony. Right. But yeah. that is also because of his, uh, the, the progenature, isn't it? It's because mm, he's sure. basically there because of the, the, where he was mm. born in this line of succession. But what about Fergie? <laughs> 
Fergie got divorced. Well, she's, she's, she's definitely she's not back. part of the royal family. Yeah, she's what, there. What do you want her on the subs bench? Well, yeah. no, no, back. no, no, no I, I, I like her very much. But it's, it's just so interesting that people say, well, you know, well, Andrew has to be well, there because he's yeah. a member of the family. Well, Fergie's not. No, well, no, she's but, it's, hanging but around. it's also interesting. You know, do you think there's a role now for Harry and Meghan to come back? Because we need some younger people. We, I think there'll be do. many people. We, well, maybe there'll be people, you know, spitting out their cornflakes yeah. listening to them. I'm yes, sure do you we think they'd have a warm welcome? I don't think they. I don't think they would. But we could do with them. As much as we're talking about slimming down the royal family, we are not short of dukes and duchesses who don't have a lot of things going on that you could draft in if it was a real emergency. Mm. Yes. I don't think you yeah, need they're to. like the D-list, aren't they, at that point? Like, you want some, you know, you, <laughs> oh, you want oh, the oh, Harry and Meghan. A duke is not good enough for you, Becca Hudson. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, I, yeah. All right, then. I want a marchioness. Yeah. There we go. I want a Viscount. <laughs> I want a Viscount biscuit, actually. I wouldn't say no to that right, right now. Right, uh, right moving Noted. on. <laughs> Rebecca, <laughs> this is a fascinating oh, story. Yes. Talk to me about a fugitive crime boss who's been dining out. This is quite a brilliant story. So, yes, this is Christy Kinahan, one of the world's most wanted men. He's 67 years old. He's got the FBI on his case, Interpol, you know, you name it. All the big crime agencies are after this bloke. They can't track him down, but he has been leaving thousands of online reviews using a pseudonym <laughs> of um, uh, restaurants, resorts, um, <laughs> COVID vaccination centres, you name it. He's been out there on Google, Trustpilot, all those things, leaving very generous reviews where, where it's earned. Um, but it's kind of astounding, isn't it? This bloke has got his worth. He's, there's a four million pound bounty on his head to find him. They can't track him down, but he has somehow been able to leave this this kind of diary of where he's been. I mean, he's been all over the world: Dubai, Zimbabwe, Hong Kong. But how Turkey. can you not track the IP address? I don't. I don't know if we can figure this out. <laughs> what are all these agencies doing? I don't know. But yeah. So, but he he still remains at large. Wow. He's a very generous tipper. He, so, well, when, you know. well, there we are. <laughs> um, Benedict, big bad news about the price of chocolate. It is. It's gone up and it's continuing to go up. I'll just hang on. I'll just read it out here. Last week, cocoa beans reached $10,000 per tonne. And I think it's gone up something like two or three times in the last couple yeah. of years. There's a dreadful shortage. But uh, obviously, that's bad news. Well, we've just had Easter, haven't we? So, you know, the worst <laughs> is over. Uh, you can sort of take a bit <laughs> that's of That's what you think. Yeah. <laughs> Though, I mean, oh, I was also amused to see on the same page of the eye, this story is in the eye, there's a story about... Um, uh, hypertension yeah. in obese in obese children, and I just thought, well, this story isn't going to make them feel a lot less stressed, <laughs> no, isn't it? It's no, a dreadful no. thing, but you know, it, it's one of those crops where there are, you know, there's a huge demand for it, obviously, and there are also all kinds of issues around the, uh, uh, shall we say, the moral aspect of its production about how much people actually get paid uh, mm. in the production in. Uh, Latin America and in West Africa. But of course, this is one of those things where it's not simply about uh, labor costs, it's about supply chains. We all know about supply chains getting disrupted, that affects things, and also things like the climate, because of course it's a crop, and if the climate plays uh, a bit of havoc with it, then you don't get your chocolate or it costs mm. you a little bit more. So mm. happy mm. days for chocolate eaters. You are going to have <laughs> to shut out a lot But good for the nation's more. waistline, yes, exactly. I would suggest. Yes. I don't yes. think people yes. will cut back. No, I think I people continue to I'll buy chocolate. Pay more. <laughs> pay more. Yes, pay more. <laughs> I really want to <laughs> cover this story quickly before we finish in the star, Rebecca. Almost, oh. almost three quarters of cheating men claim that their motivation for losing weight is to impress a new Lover. Yeah, so if you want to sign that maybe your significant other is is has got someone on the side, it's if they if they drop eleven pounds in three months, which I think does actually feel like quite a lot of weight to lose. That yeah, the, 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 one of the primary motivators is that maybe they've 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 got another another lover on the side. So that is the sign. It's not secret things on their phone or you know disappearing for long periods of time. It's then it's weight loss. Away. So, yeah. so so to counteract this, you're going to have to eat a lot more chocolate so that you know you throw your yeah. spouse off the trail, which is going to be very, very expensive. expensive. Yeah. Yes. So, so yeah. if they looking more attractive they're cheating invariably for someone else yeah sorry <laughs> what, what, a, what a sad end to the paper review what a way to finish yeah, not women though, saying just, to the women just, of the just uk just men, 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 just just the women men. of the uk if you've got a good looking husband <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you both thank, thank you very you. much indeed for joining us this morning rebecca and benedict now you've been getting in touch with all your views and uh, opinions oh we were going to talk about april fool's day as well because of course it is april the first it is yes what's the best trick ever been played uh, on you do you, uh, you think of any? Do you know what? I couldn't even name one for you, but I bet you have. I no, bet you've well, they have. Of... So Scott says the biggest prank that happened to our nation as a whole is this current government. Very <laughs> droll, very oh, droll. Very good. Alex said, I would love to prank someone today, but the magic has disappeared nowadays. Years ago, people had a great sense of humour. <laughs> nowadays, everyone gets offended by the slightest little things. You sound quite offended there, Alex. Yeah, well, I, I agree. <laughs> and actually, Zach is right as well. We're losing too many of our old traditions. April Fool's is one of them. Those who think it should not exist are the same ones who suck the joy out of many other things as well. There's Some all... people take it too far, but for the most part, it's just for a lot. Absolute mood hoovers.
Christmas. No, but it, it's true. <laughs> like every every year, there's always like one corporation, isn't there, that sends an email that's actually a wow. April Fool, and people fall for it and get into trouble. So. Yes, yes, yes. quite. Um, <laughs> and uh, Ernesto says, absolutely not in today's world. Even joking on April Fool's Day can be dangerous. Well, that's a jolly message to finish <laughs> on, isn't it? <laughs> um, they're, they're Maybe they're <laughs> April Fool's in and of themselves. <laughs> Who knows? Shall we move on? Yes. The energy price cap will fall by 12% today, dropping to £1,690 a year for a typical dual fuel household. What on earth is a dual fuel household? Well, joining us now is Jonathan Bean, spokesman for End Fuel Poverty Coalition. Jonathan, good morning. What does this change in the energy price cap actually mean for our energy bills? Well, it's actually, from our point of view, too little too late in terms of um, a reduction. We've actually paid £1,000 extra over the last year. Um, and this new £1,690 still compares with about £1,000 uh, three years ago. So we're still going to be paying about £600 more. Um, so a thousand pounds extra last year, six hundred pounds extra this year. I mean, the cost of uh, energy um, is having a massive, massive impact, and lots of people, a lot of us, are still turning off our heating, going without hot water, or running up debt. So it's still a really bad situation in terms of energy pricing. And on top of that, um, standing charges have gone up again. So they're now at £330 roughly a year, actually higher in some areas. Um, so for people on the lowest incomes and uh, people who have you know, low energy usage because they can't afford it, are actually getting hit really hard with um, standing charges. Jonathan, just, um, so that, a, that's a major issue. Can you just explain what a standing charge actually is? Yeah, so standing charges is what you get charged before you actually have any energy at all. So um, it's kind of crazy. I mean, imagine that for, for food, imagine being charged, you know, £330 a year just for the right to buy food at all. Um, but that's effectively what we get hit with on energy. So um, every day, about a pound a day gets charged to you, you know, um, by the time you wake up, um, that's already hitting you. You know, if you're on a, um, a prepayment meter where you have to pay in advance, that's using up your credit before you've even got going, before you, you know, managed to turn your heating on or or um, use your hot water. So that has a huge impact on the people on the lowest incomes and the lowest usage. So even if you cut back, you're still getting hit with a standing charge. Um, we've actually taken petitions to number 10, asking for standing charges to be abolished and replaced with a new system called Energy for All, which actually would guarantee everyone has enough energy to stay warm and safe. Um, we think that's uh, really, really important because there are so many people now living in cold, mouldy homes. Um, it, it's a national crisis and uh, both Ofgem and the government need to act to get rid of standing charges and bring in energy for all. And what's the response when you do go to number 10 or indeed to Ofgem and say, look, standing charges is an anachronism. We need to get rid of them. What do they yeah. say? Well, I mean, Ofgem are doing a review, but they are very keen on standing charges because it's a... It's a big bucket they can throw lots of costs into. So, for example, um, the overheads of the big energy firms, um, who obviously have done very well during this energy um, crisis, um, that goes on to the standing charges. I mean, you, you've probably seen the huge profits from people like British Gas because Ofgem kept pricing high for an extra year. Um, that's led to huge profits, and the costs can then be put on the standing charges. So. You know, that British gas CEO salary going up to six million a year, that is going on to your standing charges. So um, a lot of things they don't want to talk about are kind of lumped onto standing charges. Um, it's a bit of a national scandal, really. And that's why we're calling for it to be removed. They are reviewing it, but Ofgem are quite resistant to getting rid of them. Very and and why, why is the price cap still so high? It's actually the lowest since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But, I mean, it went from, what, 2,000 quid down to 1,690. Many people are saying, actually, yeah. it should be a lot lower. Yeah, so it was about £1,000 three years ago. Um, and there's a number of reasons why it's high. I mean, one of the key reasons is Ofgem have actually kept pricing higher because they're supposedly worried that energy firms might go bust again. As you remember, there were some... Um, very fly-by-night energy firms that went bust uh, a few years ago and Ofgem are kind of paranoid about that. So they've kept profits really plump for the industry. Um, and then there are all sorts of other costs that are kind of lumped into the standing charge. Um, 
uh, like the overheads of the energy firms, which you know are allowed to go up and up. So um, th that's a, that's another reason. Actually, if you look at um, some of the new tariffs, if you're lucky enough to have actually a, a working smart meter, which obviously a lot of people don't have uh, because of the shamb shambolic uh, rollout of smart meters, you can actually go onto tariffs that do track wholesale market prices more closely, and actually you can save a lot of money. So these prices, this price cap really is keeping prices at an artificially high level. Um, Ofgem, again, are considering re reviewing that, but that's going to take some time. At the moment, the Ofgem price cap is keeping prices artificially high and keeping energy firm profits um, artificially high as well. Um, another thing to consider is it's a lot of people... Tariffs. Can I just ask you about the tariffs? Yeah. Because often it's very difficult to find a tariff that's right for you. And I think sometimes the energy firms hide them. Well, exactly right. I mean, they make it really, really confusing deliberately because a lot of people just end up going on the default off-gem tariff because it's so confusing when you look at the other options. But actually, there are some much, much cheaper options out there. Um, we believe that everyone should be given the best price tariff available. So at the moment, for example, if you have an electric vehicle, you actually get a very good deal for nighttime electricity. But if you're on economy seven, which a lot of lower income people are, you're charged about double for that nighttime electricity. That is completely unfair. And we're calling on Ofgem to get rid of this kind of blatant discrimination where certain people like those with EVs get very cheap night energy and other people who are on economy seven with storage heaters get charged double. I mean, that is completely immoral and unfair. And it's this kind of um, confusing situation where some people get a good deal, but most people are being ripped off. That's what we need to change. Um, and Ofgem really need to start acting in the interest of consumers, which is their statutory duty. And Jonathan, you mentioned earlier that energy firms are keep it, keeping their profits plump. Are they still paying out dividends to their shareholders, though? Well, uh, you've probably just seen that, as I said, the British Gas um, CEO just kind of doubled his package to six million. Um, they paid out huge dividends and profits in the last year. Um, so there's a lot of profiteering still going on in this marketplace, and, and that needs to end. The other thing to be aware of is they're actually keeping a lot of our money. So when you put your meter readings in, um, as people should be at, at the current time at the end of the quarter, um, check your credit. If you've got excess credit on your account, there shouldn't be any credit on your account at this time of year because we're going into spring and summer. I've asked for that money back. There are actually billions of pounds of our money sitting on credit um, because energy firms tend to overestimate how much direct debit they take from people. So if you're on a direct debit and you have a credit, ask for that money back. They have to give that money back, but they kind of hide that fact. So people tend to end up with credit on their accounts and having a direct debit that's actually set too high, make sure that's not set too high. Check your direct debit, try and bring it down and get your money back from the energy firm. Jonathan, that is excellent advice. Thank you so much. That's Jonathan Bean, their spokesman for Fuel Poverty Coalition. Well, still to come on Talk Today, we speak uh, to a mother who lost her son in the Manchester Arena terror attack and is now campaigning to change the law around checks at music venues. This is Talk Today. It is 8.48. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 8.51. Now, Feigen Murray, whose son was killed in the Manchester Arena bombing, is campaigning for tighter laws around terrorism. Martin's Law, named after her son, would see staff given counter-terror training, increased electronic security and detailed risk analyses. Well, Feigen joins us now. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us on Talk Today. Can you tell us a little bit more about your proposal to the government, Feigen? Yeah, hi, good morning. Yeah, we are basically suggesting that uh, Martin's Law is brought in, which is basically that uh, we're asking staff at venues to have uh, a 45 minute uh, counter terrorism training course that they do that. It's online and it's free of charge. It would cost one hour staff wages. We also ask that venues do a risk assessment inside and outside the building. And then if anything is identified as a risk, that they, they eliminate the risk. We're asking that people have a counter-terrorism action plan and inform staff so that every member of staff knows what to do in case of an attack, where to either evacuate themselves, their clients, customers, and themselves um, and um, everybody else uh, either evacuate or evacuate if, if need be. And finally, for the bigger venues that the local authorities work with the premises, that's basically Martin's law in a nutshell. And, and of course, you've been campaigning for so long now, haven't you? I think six years, you're coming into the seventh anniversary of your campaign. And then, of course, we saw the attack in Moscow at the Crocus Hall. That must have brought back some horrendous memories and thoughts for you. It completely did. Uh, it really, really unsettled me and it made me realise that the trauma we've gone through is only a thin membrane away from uh, it all coming back when something else happens. Uh, it, it, you know, all my memories came back very vividly. Um, but, you know, it just shows that actually uh, globally, um, terrorism is an issue. It, it isn't just restricted to, to the UK, obviously. And unfortunately, when these attacks happen abroad, they have a knock-on effect on the UK as well and the rest of the world, really. And Fegan, the proposals that you've put forward seem very simple and effective, also cost-effective as well. Has there been any pushback from the government? Or certainly, why has it taken nearly seven years now for them to actually put this kind of um, process into place? Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's several reasons, really, because first of all, we've had COVID, so that's yeah. that delayed it quite a bit. Um, but uh, obviously, be, behind the scenes negotiations with the, the Home Office continued, even during COVID, we, we were working on this. The campaign's been five years, but in those five years, we, as I said, we had COVID, we had a changing government, um, we've had um, in, in that 
five, six year period of the campaign, we've had four prime ministers, three home secretaries and six security ministers. So these processes had to be kind of uh, almost gone through over and over again. Um, but, you know, uh, we're getting to the latter end of it. Um, the other reason is that I think uh, to bring in legislation in the UK, don't know how it is in other countries, but it seems a very lengthy, drawn out uh, process that's steeped in um, traditional rituals that, um, you know, obviously Britain is proud of, but it makes things very, very slow. It feels like treacle, actually. I, I, I'm sure it does, but you have achieved so much. We're now in the final mm. stages, actually, of the consultation into yes. the new laws, and the Home Office actually then goes further to say they're grateful to you and the Martins Law Campaign for their support in the development of the vital reform and reaffirmed, and they have reaffirmed their commitment to improving the security of public venues in the King's Speech. This will become law. I have no doubt about it. When it does become law, Will it be a day to celebrate, a small celebration? Well, obviously, yes, because it isn't just that it's the end of the, the, the campaign and we've worked so hard. Do you know, it started as a six six months online campaign for me personally, but it actually is now, it's become a full-time job. I work on this every day, all day. And, uh, you know, I'm very committed to it and so is the campaign team. Um, but... Uh, the celebration is more about the fact, not that we've got the legislation, but it will actually save lives in the long run. And that is the most important thing really for, for us. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, Fegan Murray there. And I remember your campaign for Be More Martin, and I certainly took that yeah, to heart. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank well, you. lots more Thank still you. to come on the show, including the Conservatives facing election disaster. We'll have the details next. This is Talk Today. It's 8.56. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from King City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Nicola Thorpe. A very good morning to you. It is 9am on Monday, the 1st of April. Yeah, we talk today on TV, radio, online and, of course, on your smart speaker. Your top story is this morning. Electoral wipeout. The Conservative Party faces its worst defeat in history, according to a new mega poll, with the Prime Minister's own seat at risk. Killer delays. More than 250 patients are dying every week due to long waits for A&E care. And time to re-budget. The energy price cap falls today, but other expenses are going up. We'll speak to experts to explain what that means for your money. And the weather's looking pretty unsettled over the next few days. Showers, longer spells of rain, but at least it's not too cold. I'll have all today's details in just a few minutes. Cheers, Joe. Now it's time for your headlines with Katie. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. Before we begin, hundreds of patients have died unnecessarily each week in England due to A&E waits. Well, that's the finding of a shocking new study from the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. It found there was likely to be an excess death for every 72 patients who spent 8 to 12 hours in the emergency department. And the longer the wait, the greater risk of death. Bobby Coburn from The Telegraph told Talk Today it's just another sign the system is in crisis absolutely the opposite of what you want to be hearing. You want to be thinking, when you're in the A&E ward, you're going to be safer. But a friend of mine had to go to A&E recently and said it was just unbelievable. The, the, just There's not enough staff around. There are people sitting out in the corridor, the waits are over 12 hours, if you're lucky. I think it probably shows that we cannot just wait until the election to put off the crisis in the NHS. Households already struggling in the cost of living crisis are facing even more pressure. From today, seven major household bills are going up. Regular bills like council tax and water will rise, so will broadband and mobile phone costs. But energy bills will fall as a new energy price cap comes into effect. Now, there is some good news for millions of lower paid workers. The government's increased the minimum wage by more than a pound for the first time. The national living wage is rising from £10.42 an hour to £11.44. It's a pay rise of £1,800 a year. Scotland's new hate crime laws have come into force. New offences have been introduced for stirring up hatred based on prejudice towards protected characteristics. Well, these include age, disability, religion, sexual orientation and gender. And finally, Elvis Presley is thought to be haunting a venue he used to perform in. Well, that's what his stepbrother David Stanley believes. David said he's seen his ghost at the old International Hotel where Elvis had a residency in the 1970s. He says he asked the spirit to show him a sign and the lights they flicked on. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have the headlines back here at 10 o'clock. Lovely. Thank you very Brilliant. much indeed, Katie. Very spooky indeed. Very spooky. Very spooky. Do you believe in ghosts? I do. Do you? do you? Have you yeah. seen one? I've seen a few. Not Elvis, though. That would be oh. fun. Right. Yeah. What have you seen? Um, all sorts. A fisherman in my bedroom once. What? Yeah. A Did fisherman. he have a rod? So he had a rod and he was in a raincoat in the do corner. Do you live in a really old house? I don't, quite a new build, yeah. Have you seen but I do believe in them. Well, it's a long story, but I used to present a show where we did a lot of paranormal stuff. So I, I know have you actually, did. weirdly, I have seen a lot of strange things going yeah. on. Yeah. I've seen a little girl. Have you? Really? Yes, and I don't believe in this at all. I'm absolutely skeptical, but I saw in my school assembly, school assembly hall a little girl shutting some curtains, but she was on the other side of the glass. So how could she have shut the curtains? Wow. Very creepy indeed. On anyway, that note, on that note we... we've got to talk about politics <laughs> we, now, sadly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to our top story today. New bombshell polling suggests the Tories could be left with just 98 members of Parliament. Well, forecasting the worst ever Conservative Party defeat in history, 14 serving ministers and even the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak himself, could lose his seat. Well, the son's Rod Little joins us now. Very good morning to you, Rob. By the way, Rod, happy birthday as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
So you must be. I'm watching. just grateful she didn't. Just <laughs> grateful she didn't recognise me standing in the corner of her bedroom in my fishing gear. Oh. <laughs> well said, well said. Okay, let's talk. Let's talk poli uh, politics now. I mean, this is a massive poll. It's fifteen thousand. Uh, a huge poll. It tends to be pretty accurate, but when you look at it, I mean, it makes dire reading for the Conservative Party. Labour comes out. They project with four hundred and sixty-eight seats. The Conservative ninety-eight seats. Uh, really, and many people are saying. This is an extinction-level event for the Conservative Party. Do you concur? No. Uh, I mean, they always say that. And the Conservative Party has remarkable uh, survivability uh, 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 talents and has shown that over the years, uh, sadly, in my, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, uh, because I, it may well have outgrown its usefulness, given that there is nothing you can really say that stands for conservatism anymore when you look at the various factions within the Conservative Party pulling in very, very different directions indeed. In fact, there's a there's a bigger difference, more clear blue water between those factions within the Conservative Party yeah. Yeah. than there is within the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. Uh, so we'll be going into the next election and on a whole range of issues. There's not a huge amount to differ between Labour and the Tories, apart from on competence, of course, which we don't really know about as far as Labour is concerned. Uh, but within the Conservative Party, no agreement at all on a whole host of things, from Gaza, from minimum wage, from wokery, uh, from funding the armed services, from taxation, no agreement whatsoever. So I don't think it is a uh, an extinction event. We always say that. And it always turns out not to be true, much as we said it about the Labour Party in 2019. Uh, <clears throat> these big parties, because because it's first past the post, it's very difficult to beat them, you know, and so they come back. And that's a brilliant point about first past the post, because many people are saying with, with the rise of other parties, and you're seeing, in, depending on the poll you're looking at, say YouGov is putting uh, parties like Reform at 16%, but it is first past the post. It favours those two main parties, doesn't it? It does, and it's shocking, um, and it means we never get real ch change in the country because both parties aim for that small band of voters who are crucial to winning an election. Uh, and you know, uh, the Greens have been seriously, uh, serially uh, underrepresented in British politics for thirty years now, and we should have more Green MPs. Similarly, if if uh, uh, UKIP were under underrepresented, and if Reform does get fifteen, sixteen percent, and I suspect that in a general election, that will halve, roughly. Um, I may be wrong about that, but that's what we saw in by-elections. Uh, and that's because people think they can't win an election with reform. Uh, if they don't get representation in Parliament, which even 15 or 16 per cent wouldn't happen, they wouldn't get representation, that would be a scandal. You so, know? so, Rod, you'd be in favour of proportional representation? Yeah, well, as a member of the Social Democratic Party, definitely, <laughs> yes. I mean, because otherwise, you know, it's it's just impossible to get the message across. Um, I did question time recently um, and, and asked to be introduced to someone from the SDP. And <laughs> some of the people have never heard of us. You know, it's, it's slightly humbling, to be honest. Uh, and, but, but they haven't heard of us because there's just no facility unless you've got vast amounts of money to get any form of cut through. Rod, we've got to ask you your opinion on uh, this Labour flag row. It's been hit with some criticism, uh, some patriotic criticism, because some party MPs have allegedly suggested that the Union Jack not be included in campaign literature and leaflets in the run-up to the general election. What's your take on that? Well, it's one of the things that Keir Starmer's done, isn't it, which is since uh, 2019, and, and he identified rightly that the reason people didn't want to vote for Jeremy Corbyn was his total, utter lack of patriotism, and indeed his identification with any repulsive uh, uh, authoritarian government which opposes Great Britain. It was that lack of patriotism which really cost the Labour Party badly in 2019. Mm. And so Sir Keir Starmer has been cloaking himself in the Union Jack at every available opportunity. The problem he has is that there are many constituencies in the country where too close an identification with the Union Jack counts against it. Mm. Uh, so, so I think it's a problem for them. I mean, so, um, so certainly, but, Rob... But they are, 
So Sorry, I, go on. I was just going to say that certainly this morning there's an article saying that, in fact, uh, because of the stance with Gaza as well, the, the role of the yeah. Union flag as well, whether he will lose something like 40% of his Muslim vote, that would be a major problem for Labour. I think he's likely to lose more than that. Um, it, it depends what George Galloway decides to do. If George is going to sort of put candidates up in every seat where there's a either a Muslim majority or a very large Muslim minority, then that is enormous trouble for uh, uh, Sir Keir Starmer, uh, much as will be over the next six months. Sir Keir Starmer's attempts to deal with people who think that the Union Jack is far right, as some uh, Labour Party morons have been saying uh, over the weekend. It's, uh, it's not. It's just our national flag. No, know? of course, so. but it's it's with flag. A flag is a symbol at the end of the day, and symbols mean different things to everybody. Say, for example, no, this some... doesn't. Sorry, Nicola, this doesn't. It's a flag. It's our flag. It is a flag. You know, it's, it's very straightforward. I understand. I understand that. However, for example, if you're um, living a lot of your time online and a lot of the abuse that you're receiving is from people who have the union flag in their bio, you will form an opinion of that union flag that would be very, very different to somebody else who doesn't have that experience. Well, you'd be an idiot to do that, wouldn't you? <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, it, it, this one really is straightforward, isn't it? Mm. The union jack, the union flag, uh, whatever you wish to call it, is simply the flag of our country. and. It, it, a country is in real trouble uh, when when a section of the population believes that that flag is, as the modern parlance has it, toxic. But, you, it's, you so, but the flag is co-opted by the far right. No, it's so. not. The far right. No, it's there. not. I mean, I mean I, I just, it's, it's an absurdity. I mean, the St George's flag is more usually yes. co-opted by by far right groups, not the Union Jack, uh, because most of the far right groups don't have much time for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, but it, it's you, you, you cannot say simply because someone you don't like waves the Union Jack that the Union Jack is associated with the far right. You know, the Union Jack should be associated with people Well, the pride who... flag is certainly not associated with the far well, right. Well, let's, actually, let's, Rod, let's just talk not about... this. Let's talk about the St George's flag, because this was Emily Thornberry's undoing, wasn't it? When she poo yeah, yeah. the idea that someone might deign to, to yeah. fly the flag of St George, which is the national flag. Why are people moving away from the Conservatives and, to a lesser extent, from Labour to other parties like Reform? What is it about that party that people are drawn to? About what party? Sorry. Reform. Um, I don't think they're drawn to reform for the reasons that, in many cases, reform thinks they're drawn there. I don't think so. For example, I'm up here in the northeast of England, and I don't think there's an enormous appetite for the Thatcherite economic policies of reform. But undoubtedly, on two of the other big issues, uh, immigration, uh, migration, and um, to a degree, uh, the, the progressive wokery stuff, reform chimes with an awful lot of people. Um, much as it would do over this row over the flag, you know. Uh, but they're not far right, they're, they're Thatcherite. Um, and they've done a very, very good job of getting support up around the country. And uh, finally, can we just ask you, what are you doing for your birthday? <laughs> <laughs> I'm being taken out for a romantic dinner tonight in your castle. That's what I'm doing. And then, I, but, but after this, I'm going back to bed, mate. I bet you are. <laughs> Rod, obviously, you're an April Fool's baby. What's your. Can you do you have any memorable April Fools? Oh, I, know. I used to love all the newspaper April Fools until about ten years ago when they became indistinguishable from the real news. We uh, were talking about this can't, earlier. You can't tell them anymore, can you? No. I mean, I remember the, the Guardian's wonderful um, uh, ones about what was it, San Serif, this island in the uh, <laughs> in, in the Mediterranean, and uh, the other one, of course, was. Uh, was back in the 60s, the spaghetti yeah. tree. Spaghetti? Yeah, was, Wasn't that was, Panorama? It was Panorama, yeah. Mm. It was, was fabulous, yeah. Um, mm. Really, really good. <laughs> and we used to do... We, when I was at the Today programme, we used to, if it fell on um, uh, April Fool's Day, we would do a, a, an April Fool. Um, and uh, thoroughly enjoyable. But, <laughs> but difficult these days, though. <laughs> to know fact from fiction. Well, yeah. thank you so yeah. much.
for joining us Pleasure. this morning. Ron yeah, Little. thank you so and much. Happy birthday. Now, our friend Simon Calder has done an absolute corker this morning because he's posted on X a uh, breaking news, breaking news that you need to be aware of this morning. Best foot forward Brits are urged to wear flip flops or sandals for Euro passport checks from October 2024. And the reason for that, he goes on to say, is UK travellers to the EU will have to give toe prints <laughs> and facial biometrics. And uh, the aim is to swerve legal challenges over fingerprints. I think that's pretty good. So you joke, but we actually, there was a big period of time we had to take off your shoes, wasn't there? Yeah, so it's I not, think you're still doing it. Yeah, and yeah. it's not inconceivable that you'd have to wear flip flops to the airport. Well, thank that's you, Simon true. Calder, for that April Fool's. Well, still to come this morning. Something that is not an April Fool, believe it or not. Would you want to live forever? Well, new technology could see people immortalised as digital avatars. More on that in just a moment. This is Talk Today. The time is 9.50. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for, minute, for, Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 9.18. Now, an AI tech company has developed a way to immortalise deceased loved ones. Yes, live forever mode, as it's called, involves observing a person's mannerisms, movements and voice for just 30 minutes before the technology is then able to create a digital avatar version. So, is this an impressive use of technology or a twisted dystopian future <laughs> come to life? Well, I'm delighted to say that we're joined by cyber psychologist Dr. Elaine Casket. Good morning, Dr. Elaine. What do you make of Good this morning. new tech? Good morning, how are you? <laughs> Good, thank you. How are you? And are, are we indeed talking to the human version of yourself? Yes. 
Well, it, it won't be too long before it will be difficult to tell. We're already having issues with that as more and more convincing audio and video chatbots become more accessible for more of us to be able to create with tools that are easily available to us. So yes, we're living in the future. So can I just ask you, what on earth is a cyber psychologist? <laughs> Very sexy title, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm also a psychotherapist and counseling psychologist, but in terms of my academic speciality, I'm really interested in all the different ways in which psychology and technology intersect, yeah. which is what a cyber psychologist is interested in. Uh, but uh, I've also had an additionally weird niche for many years now where I'm also particularly interested in what happens to our data when we die. So you're speaking to the right person. Oh, I think about this all the time. Mm. I recently set up the person or people who are going to be allocated, for example, all of the memory on my phone and the cloud, etc. when I die. So reading a this story- A lot of people haven't done that. You're relatively unusual. If you think yeah. a lot of people don't get around to making wills for their physical estates, even yeah. fewer people, mm. unfortunately, think about the digital portion of their estate, but it is inc Oh. Oh no. Well, I was gonna say- something available to us to plan for that. Can, can yeah. I just ask you then, how on earth do you go about that? I've never ever thought about it and I haven't done it. Well, there's only a few platforms that offer really formal, well-established techniques. And one of those is the Apple level um, uh, legacy contact, which is uh, if you have an Apple device. And one of them is the Facebook legacy contact, as well as a Google inactive account manager. So delve into the settings and you'll find out more. Right. Fascinating. Shall we go to the digital avatar of someone who's deceased? Because I understand why it might be a nice thought. But surely the whole point of bereavement is going through those stages of bereavement where uh, you, you obviously have denial, then you go through all those various stages when you end up with acceptance. What do you think about the idea of a digital avatar? Well, you say obviously, but this is actually a really important part, point to make. The stages of grief have been academically debunked for a long time. Grief is super individual. Uh, in fact, the online environment kind of perpetuates unhelpful stage models of grief, because if you type in grief into a search engine, it immediately goes five stages of. I think the bigger problem is, is that a person may wish in their own individual bereavement to have a final conversation or continue to have an interaction with some kind of simulation of somebody that they've lost, because we do have that urge to maintain connections with those gone before, or we always have. But it's not so much of a black box problem in the sense that we don't know how these AIs work. It's more of a Pandora's box problem mm. in that when we feed a bunch of information of our loved ones into a platform like this, for example, all of our emails, the messages that we've exchanged mm. between us, it could be video, audio, um, visual data as well. You don't necessarily know what's going to get spit out. It might be comforting, it might resemble the person, or it might be really uncanny or upsetting or do unexpected things. And so it's really unpredictable uh, what's going to actually come out uh, given what we put in. So we might not end up finding what it is that we're looking for and potentially could even get, get something that distresses us more. Mm. And what kind of psychological need does technology like this fulfill? Because we know that our loved one has died. They're mm. no longer there. Their soul, as it were, has gone. But there's that familiarity of their image and their sound. But do we not get that from, say, listening back to voice notes or looking at photographs? And before there were voice notes and photographs, we had all sorts of other means. Like I said, the, the urge to connect with those gone before is as old as human time, probably. In terms of what psychological need it fulfills, the what for question is a really important mm. question to ask. And individuals may have individual answers. The performance artist Lori Anderson, who was married to Lou Reed of the Velvet Underground, before ChatGPT4 and all sorts of other technologies that we have accessible to us, she worked with a company to have a Lou Reed chatbot built. And she says two thirds of the time it's just gobbledygook, but some of the time she finds it really creatively inspiring. So she kind of gets Lou's voice or lose vibe and when she feeds something into it um, and she has described it in an article in the guardian as had being addicted to it but when you re re read the article you realize that it's kind of tongue-in-cheek that she for her the need is obviously not just about connecting continuing the bond with lou but it's a sort of a creative collaboration that continues and that really feeds something for her. So again, people have all sorts of different motivations. Some people are really disturbed because they feel that there's yeah. unfinished business mm -hmm. and they're really hoping that they can attain what's popularly and thought of as
as closure and, through and that, creating and, and, something like this? And I think Not necessarily so. Elaine, that's absolutely the point about closure. Thank you so much for your time. That's all from us here on Talk Today. We'll see you tomorrow from 6 o'clock. And Kevin and Alex are up next, but here's the weather with Joe. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. It's not the best weather for travelling today and quite a lot of people will be considering making trips. We've got this area of rain through central parts, a lot of low cloud and gloom, very murky conditions and heavy rain to go with that as well, a lot of surface spray on the roads. To the north and south, skies are somewhat brighter. In fact, northwestern Scotland probably seeing the best of the weather today. Temperatures there only around 8 or 9 degrees Celsius. Now in the south, it will be milder. We could see highs of 14 or 15 degrees Celsius, but we'll also see a lot of showers and some of these could turn out to be heavy and thundery. Later in the day, they do start to die out, but they'll continue along southernmost coasts and they will be quite ready to start again first thing tomorrow. So as we go into Tuesday, it's a fairly chilly night in the far north, but elsewhere temperatures holding up in the mid-teens. And through the course of the day, well, it'll be a fairly bright start for England and Wales away from those south coasts, but the showers will bubble up, again, some of them heavy and thundery. Meanwhile, over Scotland, it's going to be cloudy again, rather murky, that brisk easterly wind making it feel very chilly and obviously quite a lot of rain around as well. Top temperature on the day, around 12 or 13 Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge Quite right to. Quite right to. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale, and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, listen. <laughs> there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> 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 yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Then I don't 